Good morning. For those of you who are just joining us, this is day two of the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative Workshop. Um, we're focused on mobile and personal technologies in precision medicine today. You're uh, hearing us online from sunny, really hot, 100 degree plus Santa Clara today in California at Intel's World he Headquarters. My name's Eric Dishman. I'm the General Manager of Health and Life Sciences for Intel and also proud and honored to serve on the PMI Working Group. Um, we're going to start right away this morning. Kathy says that she has no comments of wisdom, so I have to sort of come up with something. Now, I'm just going to go right into the first panel and just welcome you again and say we'll get started and have even more time for your questions um, for our panelists as we, as we walk through this first session. Um, the uh, first focus here is going to really be on technical challenges. Um, for integrating uh, mobile, mobile technologies and, and personal technologies into large cohorts. I actually changed the title thinking about it last night for a very pointed reason. I put overcoming technical challenges in scaling mobile and personal health technologies in a PMI cohort. And I did that for sort of two reasons. One is uh, there, were a lot, there was a lot of great discussion yesterday. And and, and uh, we have to realize that many of you are coming at, at different levels of the journey of us on these multiple workshops that we've done. So there was some replay of things that were about engagement and some replay of things that were about um, what data type should we capture that we've actually covered in other workshops. And it's good to sort of reiterate some of those themes. But the committee, and, and Dr. Collins in particular, we're looking you know, seven to eight weeks out, and it's probably less than that, is it seven weeks out when we need to have a draft of these recommendations done. So I added the words overcoming, because just sort of admiring the problems and highlighting what the problems are without making suggestions to the group of people in here who have to write these recommendations starting this afternoon. Actually, we started last night at dinner. Um, if you don't help us figure out how to overcome those challenges and how the things that you may have been doing at a smaller scale in your studies can scale to a million people, then we're going to really struggle with that. Dr. Collins and I were talking yesterday after, afternoon. I took a picture of a drawing that he did. So imagine a two by two with time to reliability on the x-axis and scalability on the vertical axis. You know, we need to start understanding very tactically in the near term, especially as we talk about technical challenges today, uh, what are the things that are already reliable that we can start to scale now as we sort of implement this? But also, how do we architect the system, both the recruitment system, the technology system, the, the, the workforce system, to be ready for what's next, right? What's not quite got the reliability behind it, but will, what would be scalable once we prove out the reliability. So, you know, help us understand what we can do now to get started and how we architect the system to be ready for what's next uh, as we go through these discussions today. So for this panel, um, you know, we're going to do 10 minutes for each of our panelists. I'm going to introduce them all uh, right now just for the sake of efficiency and speed. Um, I will be the mean timekeeper, so I'll give each of them a sort of warning. They, they've got a clock down here. We'll reset for each of the, the 10 minutes. So we'll do 10 minutes for each. We'll have about 25 minutes for, a pa for panel discussion. I've got some questions from work group members and from NIH and from outsiders. And then I'll open it up for 25 minutes to open mic um, for other questions and discussions that are there. So let me introduce the panelists and uh, the topics. And then we'll, we'll uh, hop right down into the discussion. Um, Dr. Mani uh, Srivastava is going to talk about data quality and variability. And you're going to see these topics all sort of merge into one another. Um, he's a professor of electrical engineering at UCLA. He's, we, we had a good discussion yesterday afternoon. He's an expert on mobile, wireless, and distributed wireless internet works. Has been working in these domains in a lot of fields and more recently applied it to health and has a particular interest in mobile health technologies and then the infrastructure that allow us to actually move that forward. So, uh, you know, great experience coming to us from UCLA. Uh, next to him is Dr. Ida Sim. She's going to focus on the topic of interoperability and interpreta interpretability of these kinds of data. She's a primary care doctor by training, did her MD at Stanford, is the co-director of the UCSF Biomedical Informatics Clinical and Translation Science Institute, and she's also a well-known expert on mobile technology for chronic care. Um, I remember you know, Dr. Kay, who spoke yesterday, Ida, um, there's been a few folks that even in the early days, 12 years ago, when Intel started funding university grants, these were some of the early people 
doing this work, and it's great to have them here today who, who, who've had a good decade of challenges trying to integrate these technologies and give us practical advice on, on how to go deal with that. Third down is Dr. Deborah Kilpatrick. She's going to talk about data integration and validation. She is CEO of Evidation Health. This is a GE Stanford venture. I really think of it as I, as I understood it from her as an outcomes engine around digital technologies, right? Lots of promise, lots of hype. Um, they have the abilities to come in and work with organizations to help them figure out what are the outcomes and the value that these kinds of things are delivering for different challenges that healthcare institutions are actually facing. She's formerly at Cardio DX and Guidant, has a PhD in bioengineering from Georgia Tech, and it really brings an expertise in, in her current role, especially on integrating large sets of medical, behavioral, and contextual data. And then last but not least is Dr. David Coates on privacy and security. He's a champion international professor in the Department of Computer Science at Dartmouth, um, has served in the U.S. Healthcare IT Policy Committee, which is where I certainly recognized him from, and is, again, a known expert on privacy and security in multiple fields, but particularly has been applying it to healthcare. So we've got four great people here um, with deep experience in these challenges, these te overcoming technical challenges and how to actually scale those. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Mani to go first. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Um, I come. Uh, I have had a long journey towards uh, mobile health. So, kind of, we started with sensing in environment, then kind of buildings, and I guess lately, through one of the BD2K centers and kind of uh, some NSF programs leading up to it, uh, deploying these technologies and some studies uh, with folks at various places, and. Uh, as engineers, obviously, we like to kind of play with technical challenges, but one which kind of sticks out really is that almost always the data that we collect ends up not quite being what we want. And um, need yeah, I would need that. Uh, so, uh, so, and, and this, this is this is this is a um, uh, problem that kind of pervades sensing and computing in general, as we kind of encounter in our daily lives. A uh, variety of causes behind it, uh, sometimes it's just the innate quality of the sensors, but a lot of times it's things which kind of we f you fail to anticipate or the system just cannot be designed around it, uh, various uh, variations that happen. Uh, yesterday there was a lot of talk about uh, what is it a bring your own device model, is it we hand out a device. Uh, the variation just across devices is tremendous, I was just looking at uh, sensors across just current set of Android devices, and if you look at accelerometer, there's sensitivities and sampling rates, and all range order of magnitude. Uh, so, uh, and and I'm sure the same thing is probably true on the iOS side also. Um, uh, likewise, variations that happen because uh, the way we use the sensor, the way the sensor is attached to our bodies or to the environment, uh, also biofouling issues and things like that. Uh, and then finally, um, it's a wireless world, and it's not a wire. It's not perfect. Losses happen, disconnections happen, and things like that. So to give you a sense of uh, sort of what's involved, so eventually if you think about it, sort of we collect data, it kind of goes through series of um, analytics algorithms, some on the sensor, some perhaps on your mobile phone, some out in the cloud. Eventually we get uh, end up with some information and kind of more formally we in engineering like to think of it as some quality of information metric that we have at the very end. But underlying all of that, we kind of starting out is the data yield. When is the data acceptable? So just to sort of show you uh, uh, what happened in a kind of one of our uh, recent studies. So this was done by my collaborator um, Santosh Kumar at Memphis, part of the MD2K uh, center that I mentioned. And what it shows is that starting out, so, we, uh, so we're using the ECG and respiration sen sensors, the same one which uh, Dr. Emery Artin mentioned yesterday. Uh, these were sensors designed by him, actually. And um, uh, we wanted to collect data during the daytime. And what this chart shows is that as we kind of go through it, a variety of different reasons end up resulting in uh, data loss happening, ranging from uh, people not wearing the sensor, sometimes forgetting it, sometimes perhaps a deliberate privacy-related thing that uh, even if we don't give a kill switch, they have a kill switch. They'll leave, leave the sensor off. Uh, battery dying, um, packet losses happening, disconnections happening, simply things. There was a stat yesterday that 90% of the time we are within three feet. 
I'm not so sure. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, so. Uh, just just uh, depending upon your home environment and things like that, sort of disconnections happening as a result. Um, so variety of factors coming in, some technology related, some uh, attachment related, physical attachments. In our case, we were using a ECG chest belt um, uh, for measuring the heart rate variability and kind of the way it is worn, it's coming loose. Anecdotally, even for sort of wrist-worn wearables, uh, same kind of things have been, if you sweat, if it's loose, so uh, these kind of factors sort of come into play. So at the end of it, our data yield was something like 75% or so, starting from what we wanted to collect by the time we did. Roughly similar for both uh, ECG and the respiration. Respiration in our case was over the clothing, so kind of a little bit more resilient to attachment issues, ECG not. Now, while this is for the specific study, this story kind of generalizes to uh, all sorts of scenarios, whether it is the non-wearable sensors that the speaker from Google mentioned, uh, things littered in your environment, embedded sensors, uh, whether it's wearable, whether it's sensors built into your device, uh, all of them uh, suffer from these kind of issues. So what in the remaining minutes, what I wanted to give you a sense of what kind of things have helped in this regard. And uh, that's my uh, last slide on this one, I'm going to sort of walk through it. So I think one thing early on perhaps we should think about is what kind of model we are going after. If it is bring your own device, uh, the variability across them is going to be a part and parcel of our life in terms of what the sensor is capable of, and increasingly what the processing already takes place before the data is handed over to it. So oftentimes in these mobile devices, the sensor that is exposed to you is not the raw measurements. It's already been processed by algorithms provided by the platform uh, vendors. Its characteristics uh, come into play. And even when um, uh, you are with, uh, you're stuck with a single, uh, you're going with a single device model, even then there are variation. Uh, sensor characteristics change with temperature and things like that, and not having access to that ancillary information obviously kind of uh, ends up causing problems. Uh, one notion which in other sensing communities has uh, been used successfully is this notion of electronic data sheets. So kind of the idea is that not, not only do you have access or the sensor provides you not only that this is a reading, but also a data sheet associated with it, with its relevant calibration parameters and all, so that right from the beginning of the data to decision chain, if you may, uh, this information is said. There are IEEE standards around it, and uh, not widely adopted on the mobile side of things, but nevertheless, uh, some of these technologies exist and can help us. Second thing, which is, uh, if we have failure of quality of information, if you may, discovering it later after we have collected the data is obviously way too late. So an integral part of the architecture has to be real time at the edge QOI assessment, and not just assessment, but also intervention. By QOI, I mean quality of information. So the idea out here is that algorithmically discovering when things have begun, uh, have begun to fail. Uh, so this obviously requires analytics at the edge um, uh, being there. And by intervention, um, uh, basically, things popping up on the device that you know, perhaps your sensor is loose, tighten it up, things like that. So guiding the user through uh, this process. And even if it's not the user, being uh, the steady coordinator, uh, sort of getting this information in quasi real time so that they can intervene is very important. In fact, perhaps the biggest burden in our studies in terms of running them have been these kind of issues, which is uh, either our failure to detect and kind of affecting the data yield or just the sheer human burden. Uh, so scaling it as we think about scaling it to a million, uh, we have to automate some of these procedures. You cannot rely on the human burden. What that requires in turn, and that takes me to the third thing, that besides the primary sensing modalities of interest to us, also think about sensing modalities that help us assess the quality of information. And they broadly fall into three categories. Things which are physical activity related because they often act as confounders, so particularly for like the effect attachment, cause jerks, things like that. So strategy, we're kind of identifying these and then filtering out or at least knowing that this is where the data was perhaps uh, shady kind of helps. Context, uh, environmental context, temperature, things like that. And then finally, perhaps sensors which even help uh, sort of detect the quality of attachment or sort of the physical link quality that uh, exists. 
The next point, uh, again, is not very useful for the sensor data to be just the measurements. It has to be associated with metadata, and I broadly lump it under this category of QOI-related metadata, and by that what I mean are things like uh, uncertainty, things like uh, what was the temperature at the time, things like uh, what's the timestamp? I mean, it's so very common that we get timestamps which are entirely bogus, or perhaps time zone information isn't there, or things are not synchronized, uh, so you're uh, left with kind of uh, uh, incorrect interpretations out there. And more broadly, uh, this has to be done end to end. So as we flow through the analytics chain, then the characteristics of algorithm also come into play. For example, not every heart rate variability algorithm is the same, and depending upon which one is embedded uh, in your processing chain, that's going to affect things. So algorithms should be sort of also outputting not just the result, but also uh, what the uncertainties are doing. So this uh, provenance information has to sort of flow through. And finally, and that's kind of the more basic engineering side of things, our mobiles were not designed for continual sensing. I mean, they, uh, they were done for uh, you know, primarily com computing and communication. So the sensing stack, if you may, uh, is not terribly uh, robust. So things like uh, minimizing data loss, sending data with small packets so that if wireless link is poor quality, then we can kind of deal with it. So just general engineering practices. So having someone with that kind of experience in the room as the architecture is being done uh, is going to be quite important and my time's up. So. Perfect. Right on time and very practical advice. So thank you. All right. Aida. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, have my slides up. So I was asked to talk about data interoperability and interpretability, and um, Eric asked us to talk about the challenge and the solution. So reflecting on how I would describe the challenge, because these I words are, are pretty long, I reflected on um, some comments from yesterday that, that really struck me. So one is uh, uh, from Dr. Ald, we're drowning in data. One is from Dr. Mega, we need to focus on supporting data integration. And so my summary of that, my takeaway on that is, that we need to, you know, it, it's great to be excited about these great sensors and all this stuff that we can measure, but really, you know, we do need to pay attention to the back end infrastructure and figure out, you know, how we're going to set up uh, the, the sensing stack and the, and, the, uh, and the analytics stack on the back end. And that's something I think that we need to get right uh, as we build this cohort. So that's, that's point number one. Uh, the second comment that uh, resonated with me was from Bonnie, um, that participants need to bring their own social network. Not that we bring them to a cohort and then get them to join a network, but that they, you know, that they bring their social network with them. I think that's really great. Um, but we can generalize that. It's BYO social network. It's BYO device. It's BYO needs, BYO agenda, BYO culture, BYO fears, right? I mean, we talked about all that, right? And so really the point I take away from here is the need to do mass customization, that we need to be precise, but we also need to be scalable in ways that are very, uh, very personal. And, um, uh, and, and technology can, is, is one part of the solution to doing that. And then the, the third uh, comment that resonated with me is uh, Dr. Califs, who can forget the biggest garbage dump in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that perhaps phrasing this in the positive is we're trying to make sure <laughs> um, that we have data and metadata for making sound inferences, right? That, that we know the biases, that we're careful about error, uh, that we do all the proper scientific thinking that we're used to doing in clinical research. You know, we're not getting a buy. Just because we're getting a lot of big data here doesn't mean we can forget about all those things we learned in epibiostats. So with those three things in mind is characterizing the challenge, what is the state of mHealth interoperability today? You guys have probably heard of something called APIs, Applications Programming Interface, um, a piece of software that basically sets requirements on how one application talks to another. And you know, many commercial uh, uh, sensors and you know, uh, solutions out there have an API, right? You've got one from Fitbit and RunKeeper, everybody has an API. Um, so you can get at the data. Right? We're drowning the data. We can get at the data. Uh, and there are even companies that offer integration access services, Validic probably being the biggest one. Uh, there's, you know, we heard earlier uh, that Harvard uh, Dataverse has an API to get Fitbit data. There are, there are many of these. Okay? So is the problem solved? So I'm going to give an example. Uh, this is a, a common uh, guideline for cardiology, right? Uh, preventive cardiology that you want to Exercise, uh, moderate intensity, 150 minutes per week. You know, you guys know what this is all about. And you think, wow, that's great. Here's a, here's a standard guideline that everybody agrees with. We have tons of physical activity sensors, right? So 
Simple, we should be able to just calculate minutes of moderate activity and me as a primary clinician, I should be able to get that data and you know, quickly you know, guide my patients on it, right? These are all companies that build in silos. So let's take a little bit deeper look at uh, moderate, you know, minutes of moderate activity. So Fitbit, this is a bit of a simplified view, but just to get you the idea here. This is the Fitbit um, schema, right? And it's got fairly active minutes. I'm not exactly sure what fairly active minutes means, okay? But you know, if you were a developer, this is what you see. Um, so let's put that on our little chart. Um, so uh, Google uh, has something called activity, which is an integer, which is enumerated, duration in milliseconds, and something called num segments. So here's the enumerated list, aerobics, badminton, let's look at road biking. We can go look at something called the compendium of physical activities. And I think I find out that if I'm biking at 16 to 19 miles an hour, racing, drafting, or not drafting, um, it's 12 mets. And if I'm unicycling, it's five mets. So I just add up my mets, and I add up my minutes at three to six mets, and that's my minutes of moderate activity, okay? Um, Apple. Uh, gives us a workout activity type. Of course, it's a different list than Google. Uh, start date and end date, which is start time and end time, and then total distance, and there are you know, standard uh, algorithms. Those of you who are exercise physiologists will quibble with those algorithms, but yes, we can convert duration and distance to mats and add it up, okay? That's pretty basic data for a pretty clear piece of information. And it's still pretty challenging. Okay, so think you're a software developer your venture capital is running out, you know, and you gotta deal with this, okay? So, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, proprietary integrators are black boxes of data mapping, okay, like Validic, it's fitness focused, and what they spit out is not driven by scientific or care needs, and it's a black box how they map the Fitbit data to whatever the API puts out, right? So we need something a little bit more transparent. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad I came after Mani. Mani and I are both on the Mobile Data to Knowledge BD2K Center. We need a lot of metadata. We need to describe the data clearly. Okay, we need to annotate it to clinical vocabularies like SNOMED, LOINC, and RxNorm so we can interchange with electronic health record. These are the meaningful use uh, standard vocabularies. We need to describe the metadata, timestamps, time zones, provenance, data lineage, quality of information, privacy preferences, there's a list of metadata that we need to be thinking about as our data is collected and as our data kind of goes far and wide for different kinds of computation, okay? So we do need to architect the system to, to handle the kind of data and metadata that we need so that we can make sound inferencing. That's the point, it's not just to collect the data so we can make inferences out of it, that we be scientifically comfortable, you know, saying yes, you know, that's, that's what I mean. Uh, so um, if we have this, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna scale. It's simply not gonna scale, okay? So uh, what's our solution? I would say it's open APIs and common schemas and community. Open APIs using modern technology, JSON, RESTful, OAuth 2 that most of the developers use. Open source common schemas, a common way to express something like minutes of moderate activity. They need to be annotated to the common standards that integrate with the EHR. And then the last part here, community of developers, researchers, clinicians, and patients, and people. Now, why do I say that? And of course, this is all leading up to, I guess, my proposal for a solution, which is um, OpenM Health is a nonprofit that Deborah Estrin and I started about three years ago. Uh, and and it's a, 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 we have open source tooling, free um, and open source to standardize data, store data, integrate data. It's kind of like a free validic in some sense. But it's also, you know, built to support science as we evolve. So um, some recommendations, some, some solutions uh, uh, to consider. Um, I think it would be important to agree on a common API framework architecture. Maybe not a common platform, but at least a common API. For mobile data, I would suggest OpenM Health. It's also used by the BD2K consortium. Genomic data might be Global Alliance. You know, EHR data, that's a tougher one. I'll leave you guys to deal with that one. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work in BD2K looking at thinking about how to represent metadata, how to, how to do identity. Um, there's a, a, an administrative supplement that we're working together to build spanning APIs across mobile genomic and EHR data. There's the BioCaddy data discovery project. So those things all, all come together and we should leverage off of that. For, the, uh, for getting started, we've got basic variables right now, physical activity, geolocation that we've been thinking very carefully about that's you know, clearly modeled, cleanly modeled. And then I wanna touch base on developing a process because you know, we're so early in mobile health that most of the measures we know that we're gonna want don't even exist yet. 
sensors that we were going to want don't exist yet. So how do we build a process for, um, for how to take advantage of what's coming down the pike? So some suggestions, uh, crowdsource measures that matter. What do we want? Somebody earlier said, if you want something, you know, the, 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 the innovators are going to come up with it. I'd love a measure of salt intake. We have a congestive heart failure uh, project in MD2K. We'd love to get a, a, you know, a, a, a simple way of getting salt intake on people. Neuropsych, loneliness, I think, is really important. Stoke the development of sensors and structured assessment apps from people in academia and in, uh, in industry. Um, and then be very, um, you know, have on-demand teams that bring together relevant actors um, to really dive down and combine the people who have the engineering skill with the user uh, 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 interaction skills, with the clinical research needs, and come up with how do we want to think about something? How do we want to um, uh, represent it? What metadata do we need? How do we test it? How do we evolve it? And then how do we validate it? Okay, lots of big issues there, but I, I really do think we need to bring people together around the table. We started doing some of that in Open M Health with uh, medication prescription ad adherence. We had pharmacists, primary care physicians. Uh, we had people who are uh, doing medication adherence apps, people who are doing medication prescription, pharmacists around the table, and it was a, a really interesting discussion. Okay, and I think that does scale. Small little teams that pop up, do their work, and go away, I think is, is scalable and incorporate whatever uh, final uh, measures uh, into, the, into the cohort and as variables going forward. So sort of uh, summary take home points, I think the goal of data interoperability uh, and interpretability is to support sound inferences where we need clean, well-modeled, unambiguous data and metadata. We gotta get that right, gotta get that right in the beginning. Um, I would say to build the data infrastructure together with the governance engagement and science, you know, where it, it's easy to sort of have a task force for the tech people over there because they're kind of weird. Um, but it, we really do need to build it together. It's, it's hard, but I think we really, really do. And the whole thing needs to be open, transparent, iterative, emergent, opportunistic, and most importantly, correctable. We're going to make mistakes. We need to be able to, you know, go over our mistakes and then correct and keep going. Uh, and together, I think we can go very far. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> good, good morning, everybody. Welcome to California. Uh, for those of you who, who aren't from here, you're experiencing our first spare the air day of the year. So if you went outside and ran this morning, you couldn't go as far as you normally do, that would be contextual information affecting your behavior. So I'm going to come back to that in just a second. So we're a company that focuses on health outcomes in an era of digital health. Now, some people will say we are a digital health engine for, for defining outcomes. We are also that. But I like to think of us as redefining what clinical and economic benefit mean in an era where health is digital. It's not becoming digital. It is digital now to varying degrees. Um, methodologically, the way that we do this is by looking at very large sets of medical data, contextual data, behavioral data, and looking at those uh, sets of information in different situations, depending on the clients that we serve. Some of those are big pharmaceutical companies. Some of those are very large health plans. Some of those are very small digital health companies that just simply need to validate or measure performance of their solutions in an actual provider setting. But the overarching way that we do this is sort of depicted on this slide. Um, the one thing I'll point out about the contextual data that's somewhat a little, a little bit different from what you heard yesterday is we do use time and location, but we actually use a lot of weather information. And what we found is that weather makes everything better. Take a dose of sunshine and call me in the morning. And I'm not a doctor, but I'm going to play one in that moment because every single thing we look at in every single behavioral situation in the context of health outcomes has a link to weather in large data sets. And so we actually do a lot of work uh, with that. The kinds of population access that we deal with, and I show you this not as a commercial for the company, but to make the point that we use very different types of populations depending on um, what our partners need, but also depending on what kinds of populations or segments of populations need to look at. We need to look at outcomes or disease states in those populations, and those are all different. Um, these are very different kinds of exercises when we talk about managing and accessing data in these populations. Um, the one I'm going to spend the most time on in the next few minutes to talk about our experience 
science, uh, as, as I believe it pertains to uh, scaling the PMI, is the achievement population. Achievement is a consumer portal that is part of Evidation Health. It's a platform that we use to both deploy into populations that are not necessarily patients. We think of them as purely a consumer population, uh, where populations are very connected. Uh, and I'll give you some data on this in a minute. Um, we do a lot of behavioral analytics studies in those populations, some of which get applied uh, in a secondary way, uh, and those learnings to different health outcomes measurements and different health outcome studies in the other uh, settings that you see here. The one other thing I'll mention um, just on this slide is we, we, we can deal in our analytics engine with things that are as small as, you know, an end of one study all the way up to, you know, we have 500 million uh, health records or 500 million uh, longitudinal health records uh, in large health plans that we, that we manage as part of our outcomes definition. Um, and I, I say that because I want to go back to something that Ida said that I think is incredibly important. You've got to get the back-end infrastructure right before you start to do this, no matter whether you think you're going to do N of 1 studies exclusively for a million people or whether you're going to do one giant study with a million people. You need to get the back-end infrastructure right um, because to go back and redo it is so inefficient and so kludgy and it will waste a lot of resources uh, that I know you don't want to waste. Um, so you'll come back uh, to, I'll come back to this theme in, in just, just a moment. Um, the consumer population that I'll, that I'll talk about in our experience with is a B2B2C platform which aggregates behavioral data from all kinds of connected devices. Um, you see a geographic distribution here of members of our achievement population in the U.S. It's exclusively focused in the U.S. for, for a lot of strategic reasons for us as a company. Uh, it's not, certainly not limited by that uh, geography. We deal with, depending on how you count the APIs, somewhere between 100 and 175 APIs uh, because we do have a BYOD philosophy in that population. We don't have a BYOD philosophy in all our studies. We are very prescriptive in the health outcome studies that we do prospectively. But for the purposes of this population, we, we do have an all-comer uh, kind of, kind of uh, mentality. We've held a velvet rope up in that population at about a quarter of a million people. And we've been doing that for several months while we get some of the infrastructure stuff right for scaling. And so what I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides are four categories of specific things that we are dealing with that I would recommend that you pay close attention to because I think you are going to deal with this. These are not rocket science-y things. These are not sexy. These are what you're going to spend resources, time, and money on to get it right on the infrastructural side to be able to scale to a million people. Um, just in terms of the kind of activity sets we've recorded, we're looking at a little over 20 to 25 million what we call relevant activity sets in this population at this point. Relevant in the health context. Again, we're very focused on health outcomes uh, pretty exclusively. So practical realities. This is the cold, clear, light of day, boring stuff. Uh, number one, you've got so many sources of heterogeneity in behavioral data, your normalization problem is a big one. And this is related, but, but somewhat separate to uh, what Ida was talking about. But one of the problems is very pragmatic. Time zones aren't even accounted for sometimes. <laughs> the way that times um, are accounted for and the timestamps aren't even uniformly done. Um, so different accuracy criteria in any given API um, is affecting, of course, accuracy of the whole API integration. Similar data labels mean many different things, while very different data fields can have identical labels. And that was the point that I think was very elegantly uh, made by Ida when she sort of put all these things on the table. It's a mess out there, folks, where this is concerned. And I, these are things you must pay attention to on the front end, or else they will really get you on the back end. Um, we have found that for health outcomes purposes, we have had to customize most of these APIs. Um, we have, of course, had the opportunity to go and buy a custom API, or rather non-custom APIs on the open market from the entities that, that Ida mentioned. We have chosen largely not to do that, because we feel like the data quality and customization that's required for a health outcomes kind of study, we had to control those APIs ourselves, and as a result, we ended up uh, just customizing almost all of them. Um, the problem with this is that when you manage that many APIs, you've got some serious trade-offs. Um, the quality is highly variable uh, in the best of cases if you're going to go out and get, get, uh, get them from some of the open source ones. Realize that some APIs are API aggregators, like the most well-known is probably HealthKit um, for Apple. Um, some are not. Uh, some companies don't even have an API, so if you want to use their, their bailiwick, you have to go help them develop one. Now, that may not be a bad thing because you actually may need to customize it back to my other point, but just realize you're dealing with a huge amount of variability in the way that people handle their, their data channel. Um, 
the more APIs you have, and this is kind of why we have the BYOD philosophy in our achievement population, the more breadth you have to be able to accommodate all kinds of information to define health outcomes. That's great. But don't flip that around and assume that you can give consumers or patient consumers in given uh, situations all kinds of options for bringing their data to you because that will overwhelm them and not get you what you want. So you need to be more prescriptive about that, be able to take in a lot, but don't push as many out uh, in when you think about scaling. Smart filtering is absolutely essential. This is particularly important in the behavioral data sets if you're gonna use them for health outcomes. The data feed is dumb. Um, I sit around at staff meetings sometimes and I talk to our tech team and I, I hear them, you know, sort of, and I'm not coming from the tech world, I'm from the healthcare world, and even I'm reminded that, wow, the data feed is really dumb. It's never gonna get smart, ever, right? We're gonna apply smart filtering to it, but the data feed will always be dumb. Errors are going to quickly multiply because, going back to my comments about the, the massive APIs that you're going to deal with out there, APIs integrating other data feeds will quietly and horribly just propagate errors everywhere, and they will grow and grow and grow and grow, and then all of a sudden you've got a problem. Um, the analytics engine has got to be smart enough to make sense of data gaps. Now, sometimes you're going to be looking at studies or health outcomes at discrete time points, and maybe that doesn't matter as much. You want something at three months, at six months, at nine months. Well, I hope the data feed was up on those days. More likely, you're going to be getting continuous data, right? And so you're going to have gaps because the data feeds will go down, and you're going to need to figure out proactively, philosophically, and then mathematically, how are you going to deal with absence of continuity? Because sometimes you'll have that data buffered, Sometimes you won't, again, back to the API variability problem. And so philosophically, this is one of the things you really have to kind of deal with up front because to go back and redo it is, is going to mean you're going to lose something that you wanted. Uh, finally, I'll mention contextual data. It is incredibly powerful, but good Lord, it will explode your, data, uh, your databases. Um, I believe this is the hardest to scale. Uh, so when you think about where to start, I would suggest maybe just starting with just time and get that right, or just start with time and location and just like let it sit. Um, based on everything that we do with contextual data, I will say that it is potent and powerful uh, and can interpret things that you will not see in the medical or behavioral data alone. However, it will not scale proportionately, right? So you've got triangulation that's easy for 10 people, it is not 10 times harder to do for 100. It's about 1,000 times harder to do. And so it just doesn't scale that way. So when you think about that uh, type of data in particular, be very careful at the outset. And don't be afraid to, to start small. Um, the last comment I'll quickly make is that, you know, remember that I said we put the velvet rope up on scaling our consumer population. You can't imagine not doing that at some point, right? So don't have this mentality that we're gonna start getting this, this population going and we're gonna just let it go till it gets to a million. No, try to get it to 100, try to get it to 1,000, try to get to 10,000, try to get it to a quarter of a million. You know, and, and realize along the way that there are gonna be points along the way of those critical scalability um, uh, triggers where you can still fix things, and don't be scared to do that. In fact, I would, I would say design that in. Design your scalability in on the front end, and use what's well known in the tech world about scaling populations and scaling consumer uh, tech uh, to do that, because there are people who know how to do this and just simply sit down and talk to them. So with that, I look forward to uh, discussing more, and I'll turn it over to David. So Eric suggested that we minimize the number of slides that we use, and I think I may have achieved that goal because I have no slides. Um, let's see how this goes. I, I saw two words repeated in almost every talk yesterday, and those were privacy and security, and that's what I've been asked to talk about today. But I really appreciated at one point when we started talking about trust, because really in the end, that's, it's, that's what this is about. You're asking a million people to give you their data, some of which will be very personal, and perhaps very sensitive, and to trust you with that data, trust the government with that data, which is not something that a lot of people <laughs> naturally do. And so you want a million plus people to be comfortable with this plan, and so for them to be comfortable with that, you have to have privacy and security. You have to have thoughtful policies about what you're going to do with this data and what kinds of data are you going to collect and who's going to have access to it and what they're going to use it for over what I understand to be many decades of data collection and perhaps many more of data use. And you also, of course, have to secure that data so that it can't be 
obtained or used um, by people you don't authorize or for purposes you don't authorize. So for these kinds of things, I often fall back on the fair information practices, which have been around for a long time and which apply to many different domains and which actually are the foundation of many of our laws and policies as it stands. Perhaps the most important is transparency, making sure that the people you are working with, the, the subjects or participants in your studies, are aware of what you're collecting, uh, what it will be used for now and in the future, who will have access to it, um, and under what kinds of um, constraints. And one of the things that I have seen in many, many studies is that participants um, want control. They want some sense of control over what is being collected and um, how long it is stored and maybe the opportunity to back out. Um, you look at any IRB uh, application or um, consent form and it always says you can exit the study at any time, you can ask for your data to be deleted, et cetera. And if, even if most people don't do that, just knowing that they can is really important part of trusting their participation in that study. And so um, one of the things that uh, you might want to consider that I recommend you consider is giving some, some knobs of control. If you're collecting, say, 10 different data fields, you might give the subjects, the participants, excuse me, a way of saying, I don't want this collected or I want to turn this off for a while. If you give them too much control, it'll be too confusing. They won't be able to use it. They may, not, uh, they may give up. If you give them no control, so the only option they have, as Mani suggested, is a kill switch, turn the device off, take it off, don't use it at all, then you'll get no data or you'll get big gaps in your data. So give them some thoughtful means to control when, they're being, um, when data is being collected about them. You might also consider uh, progressive consent. So uh, this was discussed yesterday. If you give people a very long and convoluted survey or questionnaire at the beginning of a study, that's kind of daunting and they may uh, de deter them from participating. The same can go with consent. You might, they, you might consent them in to collect a certain amount of information and then once they're comfortable with that, you might ask, well, can we now start collecting this information as well? And that will ease them into it and give them a more confidence that this is something that they can live with. It also is probably necessary, if this is going to run for years and decades, new things will come up. You'll want to start collecting new types of information or collect it in a new way or use it in a new way. And so you're going to have to go back to them and ask for new kinds of participation. Another theme that came up a lot yesterday was family. Recognizing you're not just collecting data about individuals and that health is not just about the individual, but about the people around them, their caregivers and their family members. And a lot of the kinds of information that you might collect actually directly or indirectly collects information about their family, the people that are with them, especially since some of the sensors are not specific to a, an individual. And so you have to think about, well, are those family members consenting to information about them being collected as well? Do they have some say in what is collected and what might need to be uh, scrubbed or deleted from the data set? Um, you can imagine that, again, over decades, you're collecting information about an adult and their small children in a family household. Those children eventually become adults, and then they may no longer want some of that data collected while they were chi chi uh, a child uh, in the data set. Um, another important thing to think about is identity. If you're talking about privacy, ultimately that boils down to identity. Who am I? And if you're building data set about a person, how do you identify that person? I hope it's not social security number. <laughs> I want to stay away from that. But you've got to have some way of identifying this is that participant, number 59. And you have to recognize that person in the data streams, the many data streams that are coming in, and aggregate all the information about that person. And this is an interoperability challenge because many different data sources have different ways of identifying people. So thinking at the core from the beginning about what is identity, how do you verify identity, who is wearing the sensor today? Is it me or is it my toddler who picked it up and put it on? Boy, my blood pressure just got a lot better. Um, of course, with identity comes de-identification. And a, a long time standard in the healthcare world is to just de-identify the data by deleting some fields. And all, we all know that doesn't work. The science of re-identification is improving rapidly. Um, and in fact, over the decades that you're anticipating this data to live, it will improve a lot more, both because of the better algorithms and because of the better computing systems that our friends are building for us all the time. And so you should not depend on simple means of de-identification. I'll come back to that. 
So uh, another thing you should think about is that you're, you have many different data sources. They're not all from smartphones. They're not all wearables. They're a wearables, as was mentioned yesterday. They are devices in the environment sensing people as they move around their home or their workspace or public spaces. And that raises questions, as I mentioned, about identity and consent. Some of the devices you use would be commercial sensors off the shelf. Fitbit is mentioned often, but there are many. And one of the challenges, to, is, I think, is to unbundle data from the, from the sensing device and from the owner or the, the vendor of that device. Um, from your perspective and your participants' perspective, you want to be clear who owns the data that's being collected by this device. All data from Fitbit, a Fitbit device, goes to Fitbit.com servers first. Even if you use a Fitbit API to get it, Fitbit has it first. Or the Google thermostat, it all goes to Google. And what rights do they have and how do you control the privacy of your, of your participants if corporate interests are also involved? So you'll want to negotiate that carefully. Security. So classically, you have to secure data in transit, and that includes from the sensing device to the smartphone, from the smartphone to the cloud. But I'm more concerned at the moment with data at rest. Inside the smartphone, and we've just heard news of a new Android hack that can hack millions of smartphones with a targeted SMS message. If you have a million people all running your software, is that an interesting target for malware? Just think of, as a hacker what I could do with the sensitive personal health information of a million people. So you want to make sure that the data in the phone is carefully encrypted, perhaps so that even someone with access to the phone cannot use it, cannot get it, because it's, it's cryptographically impossible. Send it to the cloud. Keep it encrypted at rest there. Just look at all the healthcare data breaches. You don't want to be another one in that long list on the wall of shame. So keep it encrypted there. And then don't just de-identify it and hand it out to researchers. My grad students in my lab, even though we're security researchers, aren't particularly good at securing systems. So you want probably to set up secure enclaves. And I would recommend this census, the US Census data uh, systems as a model there. To use that data, you have to go inside their secure enclave. Um, shared governance. Governance was mentioned many times yesterday. And I don't know if this is already in the works, but I would recommend some kind of a uh, participant advisory board. A group of participants, much like the one we met yesterday in, in the Healthy Heart study, who work with the team to define the privacy policies and to talk about what are some of the issues that you should be considering. The study team aren't the best people to think about what the privacy issues are and what might be acceptable to participants. The participants are best at that. And then finally, I'll mention, um, Eric said, as, I, as Eric said, I'm on the Health IT Policy Committee, which is a federal advisory committee to the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Within that, I'm on the Privacy and Security Working Group. I missed the meeting yesterday because I was here. Um, at that meeting, we were, as I recall, under uh, finalizing our, our recommendations on health big data. And those recommendations, which I gather, I assume were finalized yesterday, are going to the full committee on August 11th and then transmitted to ONC. And I would recommend that you get a copy of those. I'm happy to help if, if you need help getting those at the draft because we've just spent um, six months thinking through how one thinks about privacy and security in healthcare big data and have a set of recommendations for ONC that we could share with you. And that's it for me. Thank you. So great appreciation for everybody on time and also trying to really, you can tell, um, trying, to, trying to give very practical, practical advice for what we're doing. OK, so we'll spend um, about uh, 25, 30 minutes. Um, I've got a range of questions. This is such an abundance of riches. I'm kind of like, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. It's all so good. Um, I, I, let me, I did sort of catch just, um, I, I, there's sort of an issue that multiple of you touched on. I mean, Moni, you actually talked about it. I think all, all, actually all four of you at some point in time actually talked about it. And it's, it's one of the elephants in the room in some way, shape, or form that we need to get out there. You all talked about this balance of using ubiquitous devices that are out there coming from a wide range of manufacturers who have their own interests, as, as, as you know, um, um, you just said there at the end, right? It's like, hey, you know, it's also going off to blank, you know, dot com. What, for the sake of this million person cohort, I mean, you, you've described a number of problems. You want the raw data, um, not the filtered data. Um, you need access to it, and sometimes there is no API, but, and, and sometimes the APIs that they have actually don't work with the systems. Practical suggestions about 
you know, how we're going to do this. Are, are we going to have cohort approved, you know, vendors that we're going to work with and they're going to agree to a certain field of terms? Like practically, how are we going to deal with those issues? And did I get all of the issues right of what are the range of issues of using these commercial widely available devices? Yeah, so Dave and I were actually chatting about it uh, yesterday. And I think, uh, so, so just the basic question, is it bring your own device or we have a set of approved devices? And I think, I think even that is a tricky one. There are significant pros and cons either way. Certainly in the long run, we are not going to carry two devices. Uh, so handing out a device does carry this issue that you have to have a participant buy in in terms of that. And we heard things like how Android is great, but at the same time data like 67% have iPhones. And, um, and, and so, so leaving that aside, in the bring your own device model, the heterogeneity is going to be a killer for a variety of reasons. I mean, you are dealing with far more set of vendors in terms of where the data hits and all, uh, as well as just the variability uh, that exists in the shared device characteristics. So I think, um, uh, I think, I think, uh, sort of this idea of uh, the participant advisory board and kind of just narrowing down a set of devices with both from a technical perspective as well as perhaps from privacy policies and these kind of perspectives are deemed acceptable uh, is one answer. But my sense is that uh, for a 30-year study, even that approach is going to have scalable, scalability issues in the sense that vendors may come and go uh, uh, devices will change significantly, uh, and just this issue that uh, yeah, you end up having a selection bias of sort in the sense that if you limit it to a particular kind of device, given that. So perhaps for better or worse, we do need to think of face heterogeneity as a first order challenge, that how can we devise procedures so that in face <coughs> of this heterogeneity, we can uh, uh, end up having high quality data. But, but I think I, 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 I don't have any uh, sort of uh, silver bullet to suggest out here than to highlight that this is just, just getting this model right is going to be a significant challenge for us. Other, other comments on this issue? Well, one of the things that I've, I've seen in this, the industry today is that there are a lot of silos. Every vendor who produces a device has their own vertically integrated data chain and analysis chain. And as I mentioned, it usually ends up in their cloud servers. And one of the things the market needs to do is some disruption is to allow for common interoperable standards and aggregation. And there are a couple of companies whose names I forget at the moment who have been working on this issue to try to build uh, aggregation um, platforms where they can, they've done all, a lot of the hard API work to get the data from multiple um, individual devices into their platform and they do this on behalf often of insurers and health providers who want data from their customer base. It sounds like Deborah's group does some of that themselves and so you might leverage their work rather than trying to reinvent it. It's an ongoing evolving challenge. There's no immediate answer to this but um, try to re re leverage what's already out there. I think it's also the opportunity perhaps to actually push the ecosystem rather than just, you know, take what's out there is to actually set some markers for what we need going forward. I think uh, health is going to be a, a really big part of what these uh, devices can do. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the industry that I talk to want to see this working. And, and I think there are many groups that would want to be part of an ecosystem that that syncs together and that's open that we can innovate on. And I think, uh, you know, with a million people on, on the table, that's a good way to bring people on board. Uh, you know, if you get approved as part of the, the PMI uh, device list, you know, there's validation that comes along with it. There's input from, you know, users. It's, it's uh, you know, we thought carefully about the data and that the data that comes out, we're going to use it for science. Like, what, what more can a company want? I mean, that, that's good. You know, um, so, so I, think, I think we use this as an opportunity, not just as a, as a challenge. Yeah, the one final comment I'll make on it is, um, and I agree, I think you use it as an opportunity. I 100% agree with that because people will watch what you do and you have a chance to really make an impact on this particular issue by, do, by, by doing something and establishing some uniformity. The one thing I'll say is sort of back up at a higher level and ask 
why, why is it this way? Why is the API situation a mess? And I have a pretty simple explanation for that, for, for what I see, and it's that it's largely because we've evolved in digital health, right, to be big D little H, as I call it. And now the healthcare side is coming in, right, and people like Ida and, and May that have been in it forever, um, you know, can, can attest to this as well. The companies that are writing these device, writing the code, right, developing these devices are now thinking more about health. But their original use cases were consumer applications. And so that's why you're dealing with a situation where things are trying to like get retrofitted almost into health. And so I think in that context, you have to start by giving them a use case and you have to give them product requirements. And if you do that and you do it in a very clear way for what you want in a uniform way for, for what you guys are saying that, that's going to scale, then I think you'll find some technical solutions be put on the table really, really rapidly by the companies who want, who want that business. Um, but I think if we don't do that and you just like try to you know, kind of retrofit what's out there, you're going to end up doing what we had to do, which is what, rewrite a bunch of and customize a bunch of APIs, which is just a slog. You know, I'll, be, I'll be frank. Um, it's not what you want to be spending your time doing or using the taxpayer's money do it, I don't think. Um, but I think there's a way to just redefine the use case very clearly, which most of these people in many cases really haven't heard in the marketplace. And yet that's what they're used to doing is respond to use case definition. Are the um, th One of the other issues that y'all talked about was the um, getting the back end right. And you covered some of those. Um, but uh, let me sort of go to a higher level. I mean, if you, if, if, if you, if Francis turned to you today, Dr. Collins was like, hey, you're actually in charge of architecting this system for a million people. What are mistakes that you have made yourselves that at least you wouldn't repeat that mistake in the build out of the architecture for what we're about to go, go and do? A any ideas on that? Sh show us your mistakes because we can learn more from your mistakes than what you say to do. <laughs> I, I think... And this is something that we actually didn't talk about this morning but came up a lot yesterday is um, the data visualization component of the system architecture is quite important. We were talking about a million people and wanting to look at, um, you know, segments of a million, sub-segments of a million people and what's going on there. And so in some ways data vi visualization always kind of comes at the end and people kind of throw it together and, you know, there's all these different solutions you can use for that. Again, I would go back to... Got you know get the top data visualization companies for very large data sets in a room together. Not all of them, but you know just a few of them that people um, you know in this room can tell you who those are and give them a use case for what you're going to want to see. Because I, I can almost guarantee you it's not what they've designed it for. But some of them will quickly, quickly give you what you want. Some of them won't. Um, and so I, I go back to, to the use case problem, but to answer your question directly, I think there's a data visualization component that's quite important for very large data sets that kind of gets left to the end, and you don't really want to leave that to the end. Um, I've made errors in um, having the perfect be the enemy of the good. I start off doing ontologies, the big O word, where... Yes, yeah, somebody's strangling some. Um, <laughs> and it's easy, I think, as, as academics to, to want to get very precise, uh, very complete about the data, and, and sort of, you know, I think Zach Kahani calls it the scruffies versus, you know, those of us who are more OCD. Um, and, and I think, you know, while that, while that works for, you know, the academic world, when it hits reality, it just blows up. So you'll see in OpenM Health that we've taken a very pragmatic approach. We do what's necessary. We want to make what's, uh, 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 you know, simple to do uh, easy uh, and what's hard to do is possible. But you, you just got to be pragmatic. You just got to, you know, cut your losses. You can't do everything. So we can't get every piece of context. We can't model everything down to the nth granularity, you know, at, at the extreme of SNOMED, you know, coding. Uh, we just have to be, be very, very pragmatic. Um, and that's, you know, something that would be good to take forward. The, the other um, point, I think, is... Um, in health IT and health data standards, I, I think there's a, a, an easy tendency to become too EHR-centric and to be too healthcare-centric. It's, you know, often our standards implicitly take the point of view of the hospital, the physician, the healthcare system, and I, I love Dave, David Gustafson's point. Uh, this is about health. It's not about healthcare. It's not about doctors. It's not about hospitals. Um, so we aren't thinking about the healthcare you know, system, uh, we're talking about health. And, and really that kind of perspective can sometimes subtly come through your whole infrastructure. Just be really careful that we're not, you know, building to the healthcare system. We need to build to health. 
Other, other, David or 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 Mani, any any mistakes as you've done these kinds of things? Oh, it's like, well, at least don't mistakes. repeat this one. Make a different one. <laughs> no, I've I've made lots of mistakes over the years, and a much smaller scale, fortunately. But w one general piece of advice I would say is to to keep all the raw data if you can. Um, I have made mistakes where I've run algorithms on the data as it arrives, and I scribble the results to disk, uh, and then discard the raw data as it's coming in, and then realize that I had a bug in my analysis or wanted to do a slightly different analysis or had a new algorithm came along. And so if you can afford the space and um, you know, sufficiently protect it, then keep the raw data um, because you never know when you want to go back and rerun your, your uh, first pass of filters. Um, the others have to do with metadata and um, in particular self-describing data. So I've made lots of mistakes where I've collected a lot of raw data and then a year or two later I go back and say, now, which version? of the format was that, which code version actually produced that. <laughs> and so it's, uh, collecting and recording metadata to go along with the data, as has been mentioned many times, is really important so that you or someone else can, uh, can understand what it is you've got later on. So, so for the um, a, a number, if you think about the team, the, the village it takes to actually do this kind of work, um, let's see if I can articulate this question in the right way. Are there capabilities that you, uh, talents and capabilities that you think that we need at the, for lack of a better term, national or central level, right? <laughs> Those who hold the keys to the secure enclave, right? And then are there also things, uh, capabilities, talents, skill sets of people that we need to actually put funding for on the grants of recipients who actually may use this infrastructure? I, I, I'm trying to get at, you know, you've all said, hey, we need a bunch of people doing data scrubbing, or, you know, there, there's a bunch of people that need to do data analysis, there's a bunch of people that need to sort of focus on metadata. How much of this should be handled at a cohort sort of leadership level, and how much of it should be handled as part of the research that gets funded on top of the PMI cohort platform that needs to be done? I don't know if I'm articulating the question well, but, but it's, it's this question of, of talents and skill sets that we need, and do they exist nationally, or do they exist as part of each program or grant that comes through it, or is it both? Um, I'll take a step further. Uh, cause I want to be very practical. Um, oftentimes, the people that are accruing the data think that they are in charge, and oftentimes, the people that analyze the data think that they're in charge. How do we, how would you, if you're the CEO and you're trying to put out a product, how would you assemble your team? Very pragmatic. Well, I, I can answer that in terms of how we do it. Um, the person that holds the keys to the kingdom on any day-to-day -day project is, is in charge of program management and client services. And they live and breathe for what data is up, what data is down, what data feed's working, what data feed's not working, um, what needs to be worked on in a given project, and what need priority needs to be put, what resources need to be put on what priority. Now, one level below that, um, I can tell you the resource that we never have enough of and we cannot possibly ever have enough of is software engineering. Um, honestly, we, we actually have our tech team in Santa Barbara, even though we're a Silicon Valley company. And there's a really simple reason for that, because it is really difficult to get great software engineering in this valley unless you are a very big company with very deep pockets, and we don't have that yet, yet. And so, you know, it's the, it's the resource that never stops wanting to be had um, is software engineering. I will say that the data science team certainly um, is, is critical, but not as critical on a day-to-day -day basis just in terms of getting stuff done as software engineering. The data science team is, is hovering at, at, the, at the visionary, you know, sort of in, uh, interpretability and ultimate analysis level, setting the vision and then coming out of the back end. But the messy middle is really about program management, client services, and, and how you are liaising with the given grantees or grant holders that you've got. So I do think there are core skill sets that uh, sort of have to be in the home office, so to speak, and they are doled out on a given, uh, proportionate to the given grants that you're, that, you're, that you're giving for a specific group. Others? Yeah, David. To follow the CEO analogy, I would consider having a CISO and a chief privacy officer as well. Security and privacy, I think, are fundamental, as was mentioned many times yesterday. And you want somebody who's core job and expertise is to think about how you secure this data and what are the privacy practices, both of the core 
team as well as all the researchers. The other thing I've noticed is that many IRBs out there really don't understand privacy issues from a technical perspective, especially when you're dealing with a lot of data. They just don't. They, to the extent that they understand privacy, it might be about health records or maybe, you know, billing records. And so some central expertise on that, somebody who has done a lot of thinking about this and uh, can advise IRBs uh, for people who are submitting specific research projects as needed. So here's a specific question in regards. Who the heck does tech support? You, uh, so every company that I've known, and some of them are, are deep-pocketed you know, uh, companies over the last, I don't know, the first telehealth startup I did was 26 years ago. One of the big challenges was the moment that you have placed something into the intimacy of people's homes, home is hub, as Jeff Kay said yesterday, whether you want to or not, you're placing a piece of technology into their lives. Even if it's BYOD, you're landing an app on there and ask them to use it in a different way. You've now created the expectation that you can magically help MacGyver together any technical problems that they have in their home. So, so there's got to be some, this is what I mean by, are there hidden costs of doing this research that we should either create at a national level or on each of the grants that comes through that are the practical realities of things that don't get funded but need to be funded for the success of scaling this kinds of stuff. How, who does tech support today? How do you deal with that issue the moment you've created that social covenant around this device? But no, I can't, I can't help you with that one. So Eric, that, that's a really good point. And so just to clarify, when I say client services, that means two things. That means actually user, user support. So we do tech support ourselves, absolutely. Do I want to do it forever? No, but I'm not sure I have a better way in this era of, of answering that question. Mm. You kind of have to. Mm. Um, there may be a day where things are more more uniform and scalable such that that's not the case, but right now that's, I believe it's the case you have to do yourself. And so client services for us means both customer service at a user support kind of framework, but also client services in your world as if you're going to support in certain ways, you know, whatever grant or project you have funded. Uh, in our case, it's partner support, right? Uh, other thoughts on tech support? And, and does that idea give you other ideas of what are invisible things that we need to make this successful and scale? I don't have a comment about tech support, but I want to go back to your previous question about what to kind of fund as, you know, in RFAs or, or whatnot. I, I think there are core uh, system things that need to be done right and should be more centralized um, uh, so that there's a coherent uh, system upon which other innovation can happen. And things I'm, I would place in the core would be privacy and security, um, the API architecture, um, uh, common schemas, uh, provenance like data lineage, uh, those are really, really critical issues. Um, ident identification, Th that has to be the same across, otherwise it just isn't going to work. Uh, so that I think should be held, you know, in, 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 I, I don't know what to do it, but you, won't, you don't want to parcel. The central entity. The central <laughs> entity, okay. Um, I, I wouldn't parcel that out to separate RFAs to, you know, let a billion flowers bloom. Um, Algorithms and visualization, I think some of that may be at the core. Maybe it's more best practices, you know. Um, maybe core data cleaning algorithms might be kind of managed in the central entity. But, you know, you want sort of concentric rings of innovation where you can have, you know, that, that, that super grant that comes in that does something really at the edge. But if it does work, it's still going to fit into the whole. So building that, I think, is, is a big challenge. But that's part of the, the, the challenge of designing this thing up front so that it, it can grow uh, coherently in the future, I think. I, 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 think, I think the one issue which we are forgetting in this thing is if this thing is not manageable, then all of this stuff is of no good. Okay, I mean, a million is a lot of scale. Even in small scale studies of 40, 50 individuals, we get swamped. Uh, so, uh, so I think I think it has to be designed upfront for remote manageability, and I think some of the commercial companies have done terrific things in terms of like Amazon's uh, way of uh, helping out Kindle users, for example, has got a lot of praise, and uh, certainly, sort of com uh, companies when their own money is at stake design it to reduce uh, things. So, software has to be remotely manageable, remote upgrades, uh, things I was referring to that uh, is the sensor broken. You want to kind of avoid a visit by the individual or by some repair technician or whatnot. So I think uh, in addition to being designed... Th this relates to your comments about sensors on the sensors that help with calibration, know that they're exactly. out of place. I mean, right. the system has to be designed so as to minimize the effort. If our system management scales in proportion to the number of users, we are in for trouble. Okay. Uh, and so that, that 
even before we think about these things, I think that has to be a manageable architecture. Great. Let me open it up to the committee first, and then we'll open it up. Um, I, I have 38 other questions I could ask you, but it's not a conversation amongst us. So uh, let's go to Pearl first. Thank you. As a non-tech person, even I understood a lot of this. Awesome. <laughs> Um, particularly for David, um, I oversee a large IRB system, and I completely agree with you regarding the IRB issues. And we actually currently require an ancillary security review before we we'll even touch a protocol, which pisses off the investigators, but it saves time in the long run. Um, but my question to you, a million people, we want to reconsent them all along the way. We want to give results back. Is privacy a real goal, a doable goal. I mean, I, you know, every time you turn around, another thing is being hacked. We have so much in and out information here. Can I, with a straight face, say your privacy is protected or is privacy just overrated? Well, I guess it depends on how, what you mean by privacy to some extent. <laughs> but if, you ha if you're not able to provide some, some sort of guarantees or high confidence uh, that their personal information is protected, that there's some controls around the uh, technical and policy controls around the use of their data, you're either going to get only very m mundane data from people, step counts or something, or you just won't get people signing up. And so you have to do something. You have to have some high confidence statement that um, your data, if you participate, will be protected. And it's, you know, obviously mistakes happen. But you have to be um, ready to... Uh, thoughtfully uh, control the data through policy and then have strong technical support, strong technical controls around the data to protect it against hackers. Um, it's, that's, I think, the, the best you can do, um, unfortunately. And would you assume we should plan for a breach? And I mean this in all seriousness. Yeah, no, know absolutely. what you're going to do and know yeah. what you're going to communicate. Well, I mean, this is what we teach hospitals today to right. do. It's like, don't wait for your first one to happen and come up with your communications and your action plan. Right. Assume that it's going to happen and saw, hope that it doesn't. And I take saw an interesting out. quote the other day that, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember who to attribute it to. One said that there are two kinds of hospitals, those that have been breached and those that just don't know it yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Hey, so, D hey, David, on that theme, talk a little bit more about secure enclaves, because this gets back to this fundamental issue, right? So if, if, if we say we want a smartphone that requires the ability to actually do um, uh, enclaves, it might limit the, the devices that could be used on the network. This is a question for you. And, and as I think about Intel, you know, an Intel-provided smartphone that has encryption loaded, it adds another level of usability, level of usability challenges because I now have to enter a password. And you know, we could start. I mean, we got to assume that the smartphones are going to get better at you know multi-factor authentication and all of that. I mean, so there's a what do we start with and sort of where we're going. But I mean, this is sort of if we start to say, hey, we need a certain level of of, of abilities in the platforms that the participants are going to use then it stands to follow that we start to lean back towards, well, maybe it's not BYOD. You know, it's, it's a sub-list of BYO. it's BYOD as long as it's one of these and has these particular features. You're going to have that anyway because your software engineering will, effort will be uh, a nightmare if you try to support every device. Okay. So you're going to have a, a subset of devices that are supported, whether those be the, the smartphones or the wearables or what have you. Um, for secure enclaves, I was thinking more at the back end. Okay. So... For example, one approach to this would be to um, encrypt everything as it's collected at the edge um, with a key that is it's a, um, asymmetric key. So that you encrypt it, and it can't be decrypted because you don't have at the edge the decryption key. Mm -hmm. You transmit that all the way to the back end into some very secure data center, and it lives there. And then only within a um, restricted computing environment can researchers come in and use the data. That's where the decryption keys live. And you get access to that data center, physically or remotely, through a very carefully controlled policy process. You know, you've been vetted. This project is scientifically worthy, nationally important. Your team has been trained, whatever, in the use of the data. And the data doesn't leave that enclave. That's what I mean by an enclave. So rather than sending the data out of control of the central organization to random researchers, workstations around the country, or laptops, or whatever, where it can be lost, um, it stays under your control. I mean, for the, at least for the most sensitive data, um, that is, I think, the best way to go. And that's the way the census does it, as I understand it. 
I, I might want to add one thing. I think in the process, it's also important to give some control to the user. Uh, so if the data is encrypted right at the edge, and then only the researchers can see it, and even I don't have any say in that, I think that's also going to be a problem. We did some studies in terms of studying privacy perceptions of college students, and interestingly, even between California and Memphis, significant differences in terms of perception towards privacy. We priced it. So we had sort of, you're paying money to kind of collect this kind of data. Uh, but control is an issue. I mean, uh, some of these sensors are going to collect data in context which, you know, perhaps it collected, but maybe I want to delete it. So yeah. whatever scheme it is, it has to retain that control. That's true. Right. And, and uh, that's a good point about participants wanting to delete data. Lots of studies show that people participants want to be able to delete data. They, they may have, they may just be embarrassed. They stepped on the scale this morning and really don't want that one going into the study. Um, that was an example that was given to me by people who have run large studies. And um, it's real. If you don't provide people that capability, then they will back out. They'll say, well, I, I drank four beers last night for the first time in 10, 20 years. And I, I'd like to delete a lot of what I don't quite remember that I think I said. So I'm totally with you on that one. Uh, Dr. Collins. <laughs> so a comment and then a question. With regard to the enclaves, I mean, I get it that this is a way to maintain uh, security of the information that would be difficult to do if you're distributing the data around to researchers. But I do want to be really clear that the goal of this effort is in fact to empower all kinds of people with all kinds of crazy ideas to make sense out of the data to the extent that you put barriers and a, an enclave is a form of a barrier especially if it's physical it's not quite as bad if it's remote then you're going to limit some of that so let's think carefully about which kinds of data require uh, that kind of enclave and which don't, and perhaps have then sort of tiers uh, of, of uh, privacy that you could allow lots of ideas to be pursued with downloading of the data and not inhibit the creativity of the whole community, which is what we're trying to inspire. So you've got to think carefully about that, that uh, sort of decision process. Totally agree. I, I wanted to ask the... The panel, though, is a fascinating discussion we're having this morning. I like the idea that was put forward that actually PMI has a potential role to play here in terms of trying to knock down some of the silos or at least allow uh, more uniform approaches to things that we really are not being benefited by right now in terms of the lack of standards, lack of agreement about how to handle the data collection and, and display. So um, maybe pushing that a little further. One thing we could do, of course, would be to define certain use cases and then challenge uh, the device providers. Can you do this? And of course, with as an expectation, the sort of things that the central entity that was mentioned earlier would expect would apply to all of PMI. Can you do it? And let's do a little bake off here uh, between devices and uh, with a million people involved, okay, if you have a few tens of thousands and several different kinds of device tests that are sort of head-to-head, -head, you might actually learn pretty quickly which of those devices and their suppliers are actually up to the task. The other question I guess I would have is, we don't have all the money in the world to run this. Are the device producers going to be willing to basically donate the devices? If we have to pay for them, we're in trouble here. If this is a great opportunity for your device uh, to get put to the test in the real world, and if you win one of these competitions and show you can do it, that's a great marketing tool. What do you think? <laughs> I can call some of my, we've got some probably device makers in the room. We can pull you up here on a quick panel. I, I, mean, I would love to hear your thoughts. I, I can tell you um, of, of our experience in such conversations with regard to, uh, in some cases, fairly large prospective trials that have a digital component to the, to the endpoint, either primary or secondary. And some of them are like, wow, this is amazing. This will be huge for us. Absolutely. And then there are others that you would think would say that, and they're like, no way, forget it. And so I have not yet seen a pattern in the marketplace, but my, my response to, to that problem is that, you know what? then maybe that's not who you want to work with anyway, because you're never going to be their top priority, right? Um, and so I actually like the idea of a bake-off. I readily embrace you know, everything about Silicon Valley and the competition that it entails. And I think that you would find there are a lot of companies who would jump at the chance to essentially have a bake-off or in the form of an RFP. But you've got to be so clear about the use case. I mean, you said it right. It's got to be a really clear use case. 
and, and I, I think also that um, uh, even even for the companies that might not want to participate as the preferred device, you know, for the PMI, that um, bake off and that creation of a market signal mm -hmm. for scientifically validated, meaningful devices that serve healthcare is going to permeate the market. And it will have an effect that we are not seeing right now. There hasn't been that pressure, that signal that the market can respond to. Um, and this is a, a perfect way to do it. Some people sit on the sidelines and they'll go, you know, make their profits off on some other corner of the market. That's fine. That, that would be fine. Sue, did you want to add to this or take us somewhere different? <laughs> no, I, I, I want to add to this because I, I think it's very clarifying to say the least. And what is needed in the market is that call to action that actually says, here are the use cases. And there's a lot of considerations around that. But the clarity that has to come with it in terms of the specifications and the ability also from the regulatory standpoint and the reimbursement standpoint will bring a lot of players to the table. So very early on in the construction of the use case, I would really highly recommend particularly much more clarity around the regulatory sort of uh, constructs associated to mobile engagement, number one, or just the use of digital technologies. And number two is, what does it mean for a potential reimbursement play? Because that's where you'll really get people competing. So it, it's a holistic picture, particularly from the manufacturers. Can I make a quick comment based about the, uh, the, the issue you raised around, you know, secure enclaves or not for certain sets of data? I, one thing that we haven't talked about, or I don't think we've talked about this morning in the context of, of issues around privacy or topics around privacy are the user expectations or the patient slash consumer expectations of that. And, you know, in the context of what we talked about yesterday with regard to whether adolescents or non-adults are going to be included in the cohort, you know, let's remember that there are so many studies now showing that their attitudes about privacy and their expectations about privacy mean something different than ours do. And I think that that is a really important thing to keep in mind when we think about, you know, the, the, the construct demographically of, of this cohort and whether to be people over 18 or people under 18 and what generation are we talking about? because I can tell you that my sixth grader thinks very differently about his information than I think about mine, in, including when I was that age. And I think there are now a lot of social studies that have been done to show this. I'm not the expert on this, but from what I've read, there's a pretty broad gap. And it has to do with the intention of the holder of the information and the intention of the donator of that information with regard to how they expected it to be used. And so I think the intention part has to be really, really clear. And of course, whether or not there are secure enclaves or not will reflect that intention, but I think some stated intention is going to be really important here. Yeah, and I'll, I'll second that because we did a study a few years ago of people who were using some of the first-gen mHealth devices, and um, through a little IRB-approved deception, we um, asked them to share the... <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> that was darkness? Yeah. <laughs> D-A-R-T. Yeah. Um, we asked them to share their data with, we told them we were going to share their data with various other third parties, um, which we didn't actually do, but we got to see their responses to those requests. And if the data was being shared with researchers or for some social good, they were very happy to share. But if it was for, you know, a commercial entity or sometimes other student projects and things like that, they were less willing, as you might expect. So pe if they understand why you're doing this and the social value of it, even if it doesn't help them individually directly, then people will be much more likely and more willing to share. And so you may want to look carefully at privacy studies, but in particular, recognizing that this context is different than the general privacy context um, because there's a social good and a lot of people respond to that. So one last call out to the committee and then we'll open it up to our uh, Shariki. Thank you. Uh, so this is, uh, on, um, I guess, privacy as well. I was struck by the reminder that the companies are using the data themselves, that like Fitbit could own the data. And that made me think about the behavioral profiling that's done in marketing and, uh, and you know, targeting products and so forth. And that, so thinking about the measurement of the environment and behavior how do we think about the fact that the data we're collecting 
are also an intervention in a way. I mean, they're, they're part of an intervention, an ongoing intervention by the people who are collecting the data in the first place and who might own it. Well, many of those, I mean, that's the purpose of having a Fitbit. I mean, most people buy a Fitbit not just because they like data, but because they want to intervene in their own life. And that's the business, I mean, the, the purported business of Fitbit. Now, Fitbit, and, and I don't mean to pick on them. Everybody mentions them. A lot of these companies collect this data. And one of the things that I don't fully understand is what else do they do with the data? So they, they sell you their device. They collect the data. They provide you some visualization, some intervention, some mechanism to help you improve your health. But if you look at their privacy policies, and who does, right, um, they have escape clauses that allow them to use or sell the data for other purposes. And um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't study this. I don't know what the market is doing right now. But I would be very careful in this project in making sure that any partners you have um, have some at least transparency, if not constraint, on what else they can do with the data that is being collected about your participants. John. Hey, uh, John White from ONC. So this is an extremely savvy panel. Thank you very much for your thoughtful comments. An extremely sad panel? Is that what you said? Savvy. 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 Okay. No, like, very happy it people. Sad. <laughs> Charming and happy. Um, um, uh, I, what, but for, for, the, for the working group, I want to highlight the sliding scale of your comments. Okay, so, you know, uh, uh, Deborah says, you got to get the back end right, but Ida says, no, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. David himself both said, give people control and keep all your raw data, right? You know, over, so, and, and, you know, we can go through a bunch of others. And it, it, it's not that any of that is bad advice, but okay, but the key thing that I think that that highlights for me is that um, it comes down to what do you want to do, right? The, you know, the data infrastructure can be almost unendingly elastic. But uh, what do you want to do with that? So with his usual unerring aim, Francis, getting back to the use case, uh, is right. That use case should then define that infrastructure. And just does that sound right to you all? Yeah, okay. yeah and, and absolutely. I actually come from the school of thought that Ida uh, you know, articulated really well, which is, to me, when I say get the back end infrastructure right, that means good. It doesn't mean perfect. And what good enough is, is contextual. I fully agree with that. I do think there's going to be a way in which we need the extreme use cases to push the edges of what the architecture needs to do for heterogeneity and the extremity of data types, knowing full well that those are not going to be the first use cases in a sort of very practical sense that we're going to go after. And I think that's, I think we sometimes confuse ourselves when we start talking about extreme use cases to really make sure we're architecting this right. But at the same time, we're like, we start convincing ourselves that those use cases are the first thing we're trying to roll out in Rev 1. It's like, no, 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 no. You're architecting a system. The first things you're going to roll down it are not going to be the ones that you don't know how to do yet. So, Sue, something to add? Just one other question I've got for the panel, actually. And this has to do with, as you think about this, what other areas have you seen good governance to make the decision before you embark on this, who, and who continues to govern it. I'm trying to think of other industries like the financial industry or whatever, because there's so much that has to sort of be agreed to. And for the working group, I'd love sort of opinions as it relates to what governing body have you seen has, who have done this right? There's a um, movement on participatory governance. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, particularly like the California Stem Cell Initiative, I think, has, has won. Um, so those are some, you know, new models, I think, that are coming up. I think Europe has, has a participatory governance around health data. It, it's going to be new models of governance. Absolutely, yeah. It's going to be very different. Uh, but I think this is the sort of almost the canonical project where, where you know, ne almost need to do that. Maybe one other place to look, Sue, is if you look at, you know, post-human genome project and the advent of molecular diagnostics, there began to be these really industri originally industry-led groups, um, a lot of them from here, um, from Bayer, growing out of Bay Area Biotech Advocacy, that sort of got together and then had critical ties with, with the Hill to say, what do we collectively believe is important about the future of molecular diagnostics and where it pertains to genomics? I mean, like 21st Century Medicine Coalition is an example. Um, there are others. That was 
was a case where they're talking extremely large amounts of information, all of a sudden, you know, in, exploding into our society and, and governance structures that did not exist yet. Um, companies that were being built around this information that were, were not, you know, yet an industry. Um, and people trying to figure out what were the right steps to take given the information that they had. And so it strikes me that it's maybe similar to that also. All right, we need to get to the mics here. We've got about 10 minutes left, so we'll go to the right here. Uh, Jorge Chavarro, Harvard School of Public Health. So uh, three quick things, I IRBs, uh, staffing, and privacy. So IRBs, one big problem that we had with IRBs is that I think that IRBs usually do not know exactly what is it that they're reviewing. To what extent do you think that it would be helpful to create information and training to people who sit on IRBs to understand what is it that they should be looking for in terms of uh, protection of human subjects when they deal with M health data. I think that would be extremely helpful and I would like to hear from you. Uh, the second one is staffing. You mentioned that one of the issues is um, that uh, ac academ academia and government usually doesn't have deep enough pockets to compete with the right talent to staff these type of projects and we face this already. To how do you, th do you think uh, a model where you have private, um, private academia or private government partnerships uh, would work as a way to moving this forward because I don't think we will ever ever be able to compete with salaries with Intel or Google or F Facebook or whatever. And the third one is privacy. One thing, uh, we haven't dealt with this yet, but the closest parallel that I can think of is when all the cohorts had to go back to reconsent people for GWAS for, um, for data sharing issues. And one thing that, so some people reconsented, some people were, did not reconsent, and not everybody thinks about privacy and who they give their data to in the same way, and there are very distinct regional patterns across the country on how people think of certain institutions and how people think about the government. So do you think this will be an issue as far as, uh, as, far as the type of inference that you will be able to get in who will be consenting and who will not be consenting to specific types of data? Quick comments on, the, on IRB staffing or privacy? Well, I, I definitely agree that IRBs, it would be useful to have mechanisms to train IRBs. Uh, I so, sort of said that earlier as well. Some sort of expertise, either best practices or a person who can help IRBs think through these issues or train IRB members to think through these issues. On the privacy point, you may, you're, as I understand it, you're saying that privacy attitudes vary regionally and through different communities. And certainly that's, that's well known. I, I'm not sure, oh, I guess what that means is that consenting mechanisms need to re recognize those variants and um, com find different ways of communicating to people so that they understand, to the different communities and different backgrounds, so they understand what is being collected and what the risks are or aren't um, so that they can make an informed decision. Any other comments on those issues? Um, I'll comment on the staffing one since I also raised it um, as a small company. So I, I can tell you that the, where we've had success in recruiting like really top tech talent is those who are truly mission driven, honestly. And I've had more than one of them, and I'm going to paraphrase and I'm going to, I, I don't mean to offend Instagram, but I'm about to because they, they were mentioned specifically in a quote to me. And I asked this, this young man, I said, so why are you here? Why are you talking to me? Because I'm not going to pay you the most. <laughs> My equity is not as certain as being valuable as the other companies that, you know, that you're getting offered. Um, why are you here? And he said, because I don't want to be the next Instagram. And I said, why? And he said, because I think there's something I can do that's actually going to make a difference in the world, and the next Instagram's not going to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. So what you have an opportunity to do is take advantage of an entire generation of people who've made an inordinate amount of, of money um, on the next Instagram, right? And, and they don't necessarily, some of them want to do it again, of course, and that's fine, but a lot of them don't. And they're looking for a call to action. And so you have this nice yeah. you know, time to, to do that. And, and there's such a generational willingness to do that in the current generation, right, of people, you know, who are, who are in their late 20s, early 30s. And, and so I think you have an, an interesting time, and so does the PMI, to actually just call, have a call to action to these people, because I think you will find people that are willing to answer it. All right, we'll go quick left here. Okay, great. Um, I have a question probably for Ida, maybe others. Uh, by the way, it was great to see uh, data definitions on your slides <laughs> to illuminate 
you know, what, what we actually really have to deal with is, is really great, and that's, that's what we have to do. Um, in providing laboratory services, uh, we deal with the challenge that the, the makers or the manufacturers of the boxes that we use will work to improve their boxes, and the software will change internally, um, and that can have an impact on, on, again, how you interpret or access the data that it provides. This is probably very relevant to these mobile devices that are looking at activity. I know my wife and I, we take a walk, we have two different devices, um, and the steps are very different, and I wonder, you know, where is there the evidence that we can readily as a public look at that would provide us information on which one is right? Um, and so I guess the question is, when you said we can collect metadata from lots of devices that are out in the field, does that metadata include the name of the device, the software that's used, whether it's been, you know, a new version is attached? Because if that metadata can be accessed, um, then there's a lot that we can do as a community to yeah. evolve our APIs over the course of this study and not be dependent on trying to predict which device out there in the field is going to be the winner in five years. Yeah, we can't do that, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. and, and again, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Yes, yeah. we do have a metadata field for you know, device and model number and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but as to whether you know, that specific activity classification algorithm is available and available for auditing, um, we're actually going to do a study on that with the Stanford Mobilize Center, which is another one of the BD2K centers that's focused, uh, funded specifically to look at mobility uh, and physical activity sensors. So we've clearly identified this as an, as an issue, uh, and we're planning actually in the spring of next year to bring together the device makers and the researchers and the clinicians, get us all in the same room and say, look, can we agree on freeing some of this stuff up? We're not right. going to move forward if we aren't. So again, it's very much a partnership with industry to make it a win-win for them. That's the only way we're going to get forward, I think. Great. We've got four minutes and 17 seconds left. We'll go to this way. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it in four minutes. Oh, please well, do, because we got to go over okay. here. So just quick uh, question, quick question. The, I, I, first of all, this panel has just been fantastic. Uh, the, is it, we're not down at the nuts and bolts, but we're sure down at the middleware somewhere. Uh, and this is this is so important. Uh, my perspective. I guess I'm supposed to no, just myself. quick question. Okay. We really do uh, have to question, move. <laughs> the question about metadata, uh, and particularly emphasis on the timing, uh, time stamping. Uh, I've been studying the the uh, synchrophasers used by the, on the grid, the smart grid, <laughs> where they have to time things on the east coast and the west coast down to the picosecond. Uh, I think that is crucially important, and in, in electronic phenotyping, it's very very important. For example, from just from EHRs, and if we're going to include all this. Uh, personal data, it has to be there. I think there's a role to pl for the FDA to play in all of this. Uh, and that is that, uh, as you may know, the 21st Century Cures is going to make it very clear that device manufacturers don't have to get FDA approval in order to be useful for this kind, if, you know, for applications of the sort we're talking about here. Uh, and yet, I think one way to play this game would be to to include in those that do get FDA approval, to, to provide a certain kind of metadata uh, that is up to a certain standard that I don't think has been defined yet, but I think that could be done. And going forward, perhaps after the cohort study, I, I think that's going to be an essential uh, component. Yeah, on, on time, I think, you know, most devices have time stamps and sort of the, the data that goes from, you know, the, the, the device itself. But we're really talking about time stamps on data that has gone up into the cloud and has gone far and wide. So it's sort of a different level. Uh, we have built in all the modeling for time and time zones in OpenM Health. And in some sense, maybe, you know, I think it's okay to rely on the market and say, look, if you don't have time stamp and time stamp data, the data from your sensor is just not going to be that useful. Okay. It's just a s simple point. All so, right, we've got yeah. two minutes left. Let's go here. Thank you. Um, Oxford is Valytic. Uh, so thank you for the mention, Ida. That was great. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we live and breathe this problem of data integration and data validation. We process about a um, billion transactions a month in patient data right now. So question for us is how do we as a company that's doing this today on the ground in the trenches, how do we get involved and provide some of our feedback to this committee and sort of show, and as well as get some of your input in terms of what you guys want uh, so that we can make this better. Thoughts on this? 
Yeah, I mean, for one thing, I mean, we, there are a set of use cases that we've been actually using to look at this. So, I, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of us on the committee actually do know who you are and actually, you know, are excited about your existence. So that, I mean, the good news is you're, no, you're known to us probably better than, than you might know. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it is all about the use cases and actually seeing these. And if people have experience with the particular sensors and configuration of devices, it's like, hey, give us, send us public comments through the mechanisms or, you know, you, you, you've got our bios on there, send it to, you can imagine which one of us are working on the technology section of, of, of the piece and, and we'd love to hear your input on that. That'd be great. You may get the last question here. <laughs> oh, I was just going to follow up on sort of this idea of linking silos around pri privacy and getting consent because, you know, at Framingham we've been obviously doing progressive consent for many years, 68 years actually. And um, I think the other thing is, as, as was mentioned, you know, going into the GEO Boss era really put us through the process of reconsent, not just us, but the other epi studies. So I think that you should really look into that. You know, when we had to publicly load our data onto dbGaP, we had to ask our participants. 15% opted out for um, using their data for commercial purposes, but that means 85% uh, uh, provided permission. So you should really think about sort of exploring the, that use case, I think, much more extensively. Great. All right. Thanks. Great questions. Great input. We have to wrap it here. Um, we're going to start the next panel at 10, unless we've changed anything. Um, so quick break, uh, grab some refreshments, and thank our panelists here for some great input. Well, we're going to change gears a little bit here into a little more fast-paced, to be honest. We're doing a 45-minute session. And instead of doing PowerPoint, we're going to have more of a dialogue where uh, we discuss a couple of questions, but do allow each of the panelists to uh, kind of give their own background, give their own perspective on what I think is really trying to aggregate what we've been talking about for the last day and a half, which is we've heard about some of the opportunities, we've heard about some of the challenges, um, and now the next question is, what do we think we can actually do? Uh, for purposes of, and what we think we can actually do soon. So the key target for this group, which is a, a group of experienced folks who've succeeded in this space in reality, is to see what we can do the next 18 months. So if we're sitting here in July, what is happening by December 2016 that is actually resulting in some value for the first hundred or the first thousand participants. And the goal here then has to be some of the challenges we've heard for the last day or two, transitioning them into what are the solutions we have to derive. Uh, for purposes of introductions, my name is Sachin Ketharpal. I'm uh, one of the working group members. Uh, we've got four very uh, experienced and qualified people here. Um, I will uh, introduce them uh, in order, but then they'll each give some, um, uh, a few opening comments, just a couple moments, because we've got 45 minutes and about 30 minutes into it, we want to open it, 25 minutes into it, open it up to the audience for your participation. Uh, first to my right is uh, Ray Dorsey. He's a neurologist, a professor of neurology at the University of Rochester, uh, and has been leading some for a long time, long before M Health came along, the concepts of telemedicine, telehealth, and now M Health, uh, and is uh, the driving force behind the Empower app, which is engaging uh, tens of thousands of Parkinson's patients using mobile technology. To his right is uh, Ram Fish, who's the vice president of M Health at Samsung, and is uh, wearing one of the most exciting devices that might be out there, uh, which is a uh, not just a tracker, but a, a variety of sensors and, and, and bi-directional device. Uh, to his right is Andy Sarkis, who's at uh, the Mount Sinai uh, Icon Institute for uh, Genomic Sciences and has done some amazing work in uh, asthma, if I remember correctly. And then finally, to his far right is Anil Madan, who's uh, the co-founder, data scientist, and CEO of a very exciting company called Ginger IO that is helping tens of thousands of patients with mental health disorders, uh, mental health disease, and really uh, changing the uh, their experience with that, uh, with their providers. With that, I'll let Ray get started uh, with a quick introduction of himself and a couple, just uh, maybe two minutes on your perspective on what we could do in the next 18 months. Sajin, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks very much for the NIH uh, for hosting this event and for Intel for providing us an opportunity to get together. Uh, so I'm Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist. I care for individuals with Parkinson's disease and uh, Huntington's disease, and we've been working uh, for the past seven years on ways to disrupt the way we currently conduct a clinical research. And I'm just going to highlight uh, the two ways that we've been uh, principally doing that. Uh, the first is through virtual research visits. So just as telemedicine is increasingly uh, providing access to individuals uh, with clinical conditions, we're trying to use the simple, same technology, simple web-based video conferencing, to enable participants to participate in research uh, in their homes. 
So working with 23andMe, we did a, a pilot study of 50 participants who had undergone direct-to-consumer genetic testing. We did virtual assessments of individuals in their home, including a standard Parkinson's disease rating scale and cognitive testing. And we did this to participants in 26 states and the District of Columbia. We did this in three months. Uh, such a study would be almost impossible to do in a multi-center uh, clinic, multi-center observational study. The second application we're working on is working with uh, Sage Bio Networks and Apple on developing a smartphone application uh, for uh, Parkinson's disease. The smartphone application enables people to provide, uh, one, do consent on the phone, two, uh, f complete surveys on the device, three, complete structured tasks like speed of tapping, which you know is affected in individuals with Parkinson's disease, and four, enable passive monitoring, including GPS and activity. And in the first four months, over 14,000 people enrolled in that study, again, on a smartphone application with no interaction with investigators. And over 60 or 70,000 individuals have enrolled in the five uh, initial studies uh, altogether. And Andrew's going to talk about the, their uh, pioneering work in asthma. So these are uh, both tools, virtual research research and smartphones, which increasingly enable anyone anywhere to participate in research in the least burdensome way. Did you hit your button wrong? Does it work? Okay, good. Uh, so I have been uh, spending the last two years leading an effort to build a wearable research platform that we call Simbend um, that comes both as a device as as a cloud uh, for enabling all kinds of research into uh, digital health. The platform which is this device that you see over here lets you collect not just the regular things like motion, but also a PPG, which is the optical sensing uh, in different wavelengths. It lets you collect ECG, GSR, bioimpedance, temperature, uh, and obviously the physical activity in categorizing this. And then takes all of the information, takes it up to the cloud that it can be downloaded by any researcher and downloaded, we mean not just the number of steps, like was discussed earlier, but the raw signals, the actual 100 hertz per second, either PPG or ECG, with all of the time step and information. Um, this, uh, we started shipping to, we announced a year ago, we started shipping it out to different research in universities and startups uh, about half a year ago. And that's when we started observing some of the most amazing ideas for uh, how wearable sensing um, can go. Uh, things like, how do you recognize the signals in here to really understand arrhythmia and AFib? Can we actually quantify the frequency in which uh, AFib and arrhythmia happens to understand that this person might have a uh, heart rate issues. Um, medication. We've been uh, done a couple of pig studies. The information is public, by the way. Uh, I, I shared some of it on slides in the Stanford Big Data Conference. But we've done pig uh, studies and have been very clearly to show how different drugs are being absorbed by the body and then detected by wearable sensors. So when it comes to medication adherence, the potential of those devices to detect uh, medications, but take it even a step further and then quantify the impact that a, a certain drug had on the body, which allows us to personalize the quantity. Uh, again, this is not something we do. That's something that different researchers from all over the world, we enable them to do by giving them the open signals. Um, and then there's a lot of other areas that we have seen research coming up. We have obviously the remote patient monitoring uh, and different usages. We have seen areas around autism and being able to track the emotional response of autistic kids when you send them to school or send them to uh, other facilities and knowing how they, uh, what ha actually happened to them emotionally during the day by looking at the HRV and the GSR. Um, sleep analysis and really understanding your sleep cycles and then being able to extract other signals, you know, uh, there are some pot potential to extract CO2 um, and hydration levels from some of those signals. So it's been absolutely fascinating when we open and give this platform to different researchers, the kind of ideas 
and research opportunities that we have seen coming up. Uh, so that's the very roughly the background on what I do. Um, and then later on we'll get into some of the challenges and uh, Correct. what I see. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, okay, so um, I am actually trained originally as a geneticist. I'm vice chair in the Department of Genetics, but I'm actually involved uh, here today probably because I've grown less enthralled by genetics than I am by environment and being able to measure phenotype. Um, because I think we found that oftentimes genetic effects are subtle, uh, especially for common disease, and the environmental determinants are very, very important. So some of the work we've been doing, uh, again, with uh, the Apple Research Kit platform and asthma, uh, has resulted in enrolling about 8,000 patients, uh, so, just, sorry, so just not patients, um, although they are asthmatics, they're all uh, either poorly controlled to well-controlled uh, asthma patients. And um, that's been a very insightful uh, study for us over the past couple months, in that we've been able to see not only have we recapitulated what you would expect for the demographics of an asthma population in the United States based on their large uh, existing studies, but we've also been able to see uh, some hints that um, you would actually be able to affect the things that matter to asthma patients most, such as uh, diminution of activity. Uh, so it appears that uh, by using an app in this study, uh, they have become more active based on self-report and also based on step counts. Um, now, there's no control group in this in the sense of what is the control group for giving an app? Obviously, these are engaged patients who become more engaged because they can actually look at things. But we're very intrigued by looking at the effect of allowing patients more awareness of their health condition. And going forward, we're really eager to try and integrate that with uh, the EMR and the actual classic medical care because we are at a health system with about 3.1 million patient visits a year. And so there's an opportunity to think about the integration of the data that comes from consumer applications into the actual health uh, providing thing. And then I guess the final point I'll make is that uh, I personally, and I think our organizations become fairly convinced that one of the best things you can do for the quality of data is actually to allow people who are about whom the data is collected, ownership of the data, and the, the ability to move it, port it, uh, and shake it and share it. Uh, because in the end of the day, if you want high quality QC of your data, uh, the people who are going to be most interested in that data is, of course, the people about, who it, about whom it is, right? I care about my data. I will go to the trouble of making sure that it's accurate in a way that no one else ever will. And so I would think that that's something that this committee ought to think about in terms of trying to ensure a high quality data set is that the actual participants be able to actually to fully access, work with, and share their data with anyone they thought was important. Because one of the things that's very clear from our research kit study is that the majority of people who volunteer for that are more than happy to share their data. Uh, and this is pretty intimate data um, with uh, most researchers, actually, which I thought was encouraging. Um. Great, thanks. Cool. Um, hi, my name's uh, Anwar. I'm Mitchin Shire. Thank you for, uh, for having me here, part of this discussion. Um, some quick background. I'm a computer scientist by training. I uh, spent the last decade of my life uh, modeling human behavior using machine learning in various forms. Um, and then ended up starting a company post my PhD uh, that commercializes the work I was doing for my thesis. Um, so it's going to sound a little bit like science fiction, but basically it turns out your phone has all these incredible sensors. Uh, it's an incredible diary of your life. I think we've heard a lot of speakers uh, last couple of days talk about it. Um, and so typically, in exa for example, in mental health, when uh, people see a psychiatrist, they're looking for all sorts of behaviors that you can now start to capture to some extent using a person's smartphone. So are they moving apart? Are they socializing? Are they getting enough sleep? Um, a lot of those sorts of behaviors. Um, we, are, we work with, uh, obviously, the healthcare system and, and sort of large uh, providers, peer providers, um, and to drive interventions at the right time, but a big part of our company has actually been supporting research. Uh, and you know, because we believe in outcomes, because we think actually showing this data uh, can be used to drive uh, better interventions and better outcomes is really important. Uh, we are now being used by over 15 different research projects. I think you heard uh, at least one of them yesterday with the Healthy Heart Study. Uh, eight of the top 10 academic medical centers in the country, so uh, Stanford, folks at Partners, a um, variety of other institutions, UCSF, Cleveland Clinic, are using Gingerio. Um And just to give you a sense of the scale, so we've screened about half a million people with anxiety and depression. Um, we have about uh, a quarter million uh, assessments, which are things like PHQ-9 assessments, CAD-7s, uh, assessments for other mental health conditions, other behavioral health conditions as well. Um, and I think at last count, we had about uh, 400 million or 500 million hours of behavior data to go with that. 
Um, and so obviously a lot of lessons that we've been talking about in terms of how do you build the user experience, how do you build the data infrastructure, how do you manage this in a real world setting are things that we've had to deal with uh, in the last three years if we actually scaled through that. So happy to spend as much time there. Um, I had some specific points on the things I had heard, uh, but I'm going to save those for when I'm asked that question. Great. Thank you for that self-restraint so we can guide the conversation a bit. Um, what I wanted to take is there's a sense of scale here that is, I think, underappreciated. Each of you is uh, thousands of uh, participants that are using your platforms. Um, however, it's in a somewhat, um, in, in many situations, a disease-specific context, a very motivated, um, self-selected group, either in uh, mental health, asthma, Parkinson's. In, in those areas, how do we what are the choices we have to make as a group? Are we recommending that the first use case scenario, the first pilot, is a disease-specific use of mHealth? Or do we think there's enough commonality, whether it's activity tracking or sleep cycles? Do you think that the, the app that's going to get the country excited about mHealth and precision medicine is cross-cutting across thousands of users? So tell me, is this about vertical... Um, Depth, or is this about breadth? What is each of your perspectives on that, having been a vertical person? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Maybe I'll start. I think that there probably are some aspects of being human uh, that are relevant for most of your health and disease, and we ought to focus <laughs> on those. Uh, sleep will be one of them. Uh, activity might be another. Social interaction might be a third. We heard about that from lots of people yesterday. So I would expect that there are probably some things that really do cross, cut across most diseases and most aspects of human uh, well-being. So I uh, certainly agree with that assessment. I think there's also there's another perspective to this, right? So uh, if you want to recruit 100,000 participants or a million participants for a study, well, the first thing you need to do is give them value, right? Um, and people aren't going to install an app or use a platform just because it helps them track their sleep when there's like 300 other tools that let them do that. And what do people want for value? Well, actually, people want to get better. Right? And so if you pick a disease area, if you pick some, you know, it may not be one, it may be three or five, uh, but you're sort of doing things that actually help people with self-reflection in that disease area, that give them some tools that maybe help them self-manage. As part of that version, uh, I think that may be the right sort of uh, starting point, is it's not just one disease, but it's not everything, where it becomes really confusing from a user experience perspective, from a value perspective. I'm not sure they're mutually exclusive, so I think you can do both. Even for the initial five research apps that were released, uh, the research kit, there was a common uh, platform for uh, many of them that was uh, gathering similar data, and then you could have uh, modules that might be specific uh, to the disease. Um, uh, so I think you, you could do both. Um, so I I'm the one who's the only way that I can call myself vertical if you say that, well, we are focusing on the wrist and detecting from the wrist. <laughs> but beyond that, it's really a horizontal platform, and that's why we are seeing so many different ideas. But if I take the opposite approach that says, what can be the win that will be on an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in the next 18 months? And an article in the New York Times and the Washington Post that we would like to see. Where do I see the real big wins that we can get to? I believe it will be the title of research sponsored by the PMI shows that uh, heart irregularities and heart attacks can be detected earlier on and we can save life. That's the one win that I believe is attainable. Uh, for the next 18 months and will really be uh, groundbreaking. And when you look at the signals, like we've already seen things in our lab that we put this on one of the guys in the lab. We have seen irregularities. He had uh, three PVCs within 25 seconds. Uh, we were concerned about it. Three months later, the guy had a heart attack. Survived, luckily. But the initial signs of the potentials are that if you know how to look at the signals, if you look, you know how to process them, and you are putting something like this or, you know, any of the Google devices or Apple devices with the right algorithm, with the right intelligence around those signals, and it's not easy, but it's doable, uh, we will be able to detect and help cardiovascular disease uh, much earlier on. 
Actually, do you mind if I... Tag Please. I actually want to underline that point a lot because I feel like we've spent the last day and a half talking about a lot of the tactical pieces, right? And how we're going to standardize the data and how we're going to, like, you know, make sure it's all stored correctly and analyze it. And we have to do those things, don't get me wrong, right? But I think that it's important to actually talk about what do you want to achieve? And so I'll give you two examples in mental health, right? And I've been thinking about this. So one is, at the end of 2016, can we reduce our dependencies on, self, on surveys or, or self-reported information in mental health? Right. Can we do that? Can we make the PHQ-9 obsolete because we now have behavior measurements? And is that a two-year plan or a three-year plan? Is a five-year plan that DSM-6 or DSM-7 is actually based on um, you know, behavior data, not just self-reported or, or uh, in-session data with a psychiatrist? Like, can, we, can we get to that point? I mean, those are the sort of grand challenges that I think the field needs. Uh, for us to sort of really rally behind. And we'll figure out all the other stuff that we have to do to get there. But I think finding that big vision and underlining that is really, really important to Ram's point. So just echoing that, I think we're fundamentally underestimating what we can achieve. Um, just in our Parkinson's app in the first, you know, three, four months, we've been able to uh, demonstrate that the app can differentiate individuals with Parkinson's from those without. So, you know, can you have an app in the future that you can use to uh, diagnose whether someone might have Parkinson's disease or not? You know, that's a powerful concept. You know, you could extend that to Alzheimer's disease and other conditions, asthma probably. Um, second, we've been able to detect pharmacological response to treatment. So with, it, with the phone, we can uh, identify that people are getting better after they take their medicine for Parkinson's disease. You know, that's a pretty uh, a powerful uh, concept. And then third, you know, we had uh, 5,000 participants give us 20,000 free text uh, things on what they think makes them better or worse. And number three was weather. And uh, I just did a quick PubMed search on weather and Parkinson's disease, and the only thing I found was that some people with Parkinson's disease get frozen, meaning that they can't walk. So it's never been even, it's, it's never been even examined. It's never even been considered. I, I didn't even thought about it. So I think, you know, in four months, we've learned things in Parkinson's disease that we didn't, uh, didn't really even know about. And I think, you know, all of us have had similar experiences. And that's the purpose of this group is to tell us what is out there that we could actually succeed with in the short term while building foundations for the long term. So we don't want to uh, prevent long term success to, due to impatience. But what I'm hearing is that there's more opportunities and despite what we've heard over the last day and a half regarding the challenges of synchronizing a BYOD model despite the lack of standards, that if you make some tough choices that you can succeed. And it seems like one theme I've heard here, though, is that you've had to make tough platform choices. You've had to pick a platform. I haven't heard a lot of success stories in a BYOD model within a disease, and I haven't heard a lot of success stories of um, two different platforms. Is that a choice that this group has to make in order to succeed in 18 months? Does December 2016 require for one group and one disease process or one width that it's uh, the Android platform and for a different one, it's the, should we be considering those trade-offs now or do you think that the platforms are mature enough to allow us to have a more inclusive perspective on devices? Sorry, I'll start with this one and you guys can chime in. So, um, so a couple of points on platforms. So first is, um, I think a lot of the tools we spoke about, OpenM Health, us, a uh, bunch of other companies that are doing this or tools that are doing this, are actually cross-platform. So it's iOS and Android, right? And at some level, uh, the data generation itself, as we've heard, is, is, go is becoming commodity. It's becoming part of the operating system. Uh, again, there's a standardization issue, so you have to adjust for, for what those things actually mean. Um, so I think that's one. I think the second thing that was interesting for me was, and, and this may be slightly controversial, but I think it's kind of silly that we're in 2015 and we're talking about should we have BYO to be BYOD, right? Like we're not in 2005 sitting at BlackBerry's offices saying that people are going to have two different devices. Like those devices are out there. So we may choose to support a limited subset as sort of a place to control that experience or whatever. But I think, I think the reality is that there's, you know, 100 million Fitbits sold this year, whether we like the way they're collecting the data or not. Um, if you're running, uh, my experience has been, if you're trying to run the research right now, you want to take out any possible uh, distractions out of your way or any possible source of errors out of your way. So I would say absolutely, if you're trying to study something in the next 18 months, pick one device, give it to your participants, and rely on it. I'll give some specific examples why it can be really bad if you don't. Let's say you took two or three different devices and you tried to count steps. And I had somebody like this who came to us actually 
on the Parkinson uh, related study. It says, if you try to use our devices and Fitbit and Apple, you'll end up in a nightmare. Each one of them has different algorithms to counting steps. Each one of them has different ways of classifying the activity. Um, so go and pick a device. For their specific uh, study, surprisingly, even though I work for Samsung, I basically told them, go and work with Apple. But uh, if, if, I was, if I had to do a specific study, I would absolutely say, I'm taking as many things out of the equation. I will pick for this specific study, I will pick this device. For another study, completely different story. It might be a very different device. But I would not try to mix and match uh, devices within a study uh, unless there is something very specific I'm trying to prove by using those two different devices. In the short term? In the short term, okay. yes. In the next year and a half, in the short term, uh, pick a device for a study and focus. T take all the variables you can out of, of complexity out of it. So you focus your efforts on what you're trying to research and prove. Right. So maybe just to expand on that a little bit, um, I think the, the key point is focus. I mean, um, by deciding we're going to develop an app for Apple Research Kit, you know, it just meant that we didn't have to spend time talking about a bunch of platform decisions. Uh, that just helps you get things done because you don't have to talk about a bunch of decisions. Um, just as important would be the questions about what are we going to focus on. So I think Bonnie's point yesterday about you know, college kids at Dartmouth, what do they actually care about? What would provide value to them? Those questions are just as important as platform, uh, and maybe more so, because for some of the things that actually are going to turn out to be generally relevant to human health, it might be behavior, it might be interactions, such as the other speaker from Dartmouth mentioned yesterday. Um, you know, these sorts of things can probably be inherently class platform. Are you talking to people? Are you sleeping? Mm -hmm. uh, if you know, that's a picture of your overall behavioral health, maybe that's actually one of the most important things to look at. So I think it's less a question about platform, it's a question about determination and focus to define a set of use cases that are broadly applicable to this cohort and to get started on it. Uh, and it may be that you need to lock down to one or a few platforms to do that initially uh, for a rollout based on the demographics of what platforms are out there. But uh, it's really more about decision making than it is about a specific platform, I think. So just one point that somebody asked in the questions earlier and I thought was really important. It goes way beyond just choosing a device. The topic of software upgrades can be complete hell if you're trying to run a research. And somebody just upgraded the algorithm for counting steps in the middle of your study. And you know, this is just the most basic algorithm update for heart rate, have blood pressure, blood pressure proxy, HRV. If you have multiple devices and then each one gets different software upgrades while you're doing the study, you're doomed. So focus. And remember, when you're using a device, think very carefully what's the software version you're doing for what data collection. And if you upgrade, you need to really understand what you're upgrading to and what's the impact been. So actually, I want to add a comment there. So I think this gets us to a fundamental tension that actually is inherent here, right? And so in the Met device world, you get three months to go design your hardware, test it, QA it, and do all this other stuff. But in the computer science world of things, right, when Google's running their web servers or Facebook's running their web servers, they're probably running a thousand experiments a day that none of us even realize. And if we are going to build something that's scalable, if you are going to be build something that has to iterate rapidly and like evolve, we're going to have to find the right balance. And I don't know whether it's a new kind of study design approach. I know there's some papers about that. Or if there's some other things that we put in place that allows us to do both, right? Because over time, the systems are getting, I mean, most software companies are shipping code three times a day, right? With everybody's using continuous deployment and continuous integration and all this other stuff. So how do you, how do you merge those two worlds together in the traditional like, you know, make pause everything for six months and don't change a single thing. I don't know. I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, one, thing, uh, one thing to add to it, and again, that's a point that somebody made earlier, but I think is important. Um, it's, we believe that it's not enough just to spit data out. Every time we spit data out, we need to give you the confidence in this data, and that's a very different dimension. So, for example, the way the Simband 
mechanism is built, and I'm, I shall, I, I, I'm sharing this because I think it's inherent that every other device vendor needs to try to follow it, is when we put out a stream of sensor, we spit it out together with confidence indicators. So it's not just time value stream of uh, PPG or ECG, there's also a time confidence value and confidence is numerical at zero to four, you know, the sensor is completely off or really bad data. Uh, and then this confidence indicator goes up as more sensors are used to processing it. So while we might have a confidence indicator associated with the raw ECG, we then might have a different confidence indicator associated with the bit detection on top of the uh, ECG. And then if somebody is running another algorithm trying to detect arrhythmia on top of the ECG, they will spit up their own confidence in the results of their algorithm. So adding these dimensions really allows us much more intelligent understanding of the data that comes out of the device. Great point regarding quality and transparency. Um, we've got about uh, 12, 13 minutes left in the session. If there's any questions from the working group or the audience, if you want to go ahead and come on up. Um, yes. Hi. <clears throat> I'm uh, Greg Marcus. I'm one of the PIs of the Healthy Heart Study um, and just wanted to share our experience. Uh, I, think, I think these two questions regarding being disease-specific and being device-specific actually have an interesting overlap, and I can share our experience. So we started with an emphasis on cardiology, cardiovascular health, but decided from the beginning to be very de device and platform agnostic. And what we have found is that a lot of researchers are very interested in using our platform from different fields. So we have um, collaborators from urology, from um, um, what, urology, neurology, pulmonary, et cetera, et cetera. And we recognize that I think in part because we've been device agnostic and therefore able to offer uh, multiple types of measurements, that that's generated more interest from a variety of potential collaborators and we've quickly recognized, even though our initial motivations were <clears throat> to improve cardiovascular health, that really we're, what we've transitioned to is a greater interest in providing a platform much more broadly from a, from a field or discipline uh, standpoint. So you enabled for the future but succeeded in the short term as well by having a disease-specific pathway. Tell me the ramp that that took, though. Was that a two- or three-year ramp, or was that a one-year ramp? Because that trade-off is there. So as soon as we had integrations available, we were hearing, I would say, within a few months, as soon as we had our platform up, we were hearing from, from physicians from other fields. How long did it take to get the platform up? I think that's the, the tension of the so, more diverse. About a year. I would say about a year. Thank you. Th thoughts on that balance from the panelists of uh, being somewhat disease specific, but the tension then being that you remain uh, device and platform agnostic uh, to enable things? Is, is that what you've done in any of your disease? Sounds like Ginger IO, that's been the model, uh, being disease specific yet platform agnostic. We actually started by doing a lot of different diseases uh, because we weren't really sure where we were going to end up, and then last couple of years focused on mental health. Just want to say, right? I do. I'm in the remediation school here. Sec. <laughs> um, thank you very much to all of you for contributing to this discussion. Um, I have a specific question for Anmol. Um, so it looked like the tracking aspect of it, the things that seem most robust right now are, let's say, activity, uh, sleep, and then, as you mentioned, maybe social interaction. So maybe you could describe to us a little bit about the kind of things you're measuring to be able to predict things like depression? What are the elements that go into uh, this measurement of social interaction? Yeah, so, um, so, I'll, so the, the underlying intuition is there's a variety of behavioral changes that are expected in mental health that you can start to see some of that in your phone. Um, specifically sensors, so phones have uh, location using different, you know, different sensors, obviously you can triangulate, uh, GPS, all this other stuff. Um, calling, texting, accelerometer data, um, turns out, um, as Andrew mentioned as well yesterday, is, um, you know, interesting how people sort of pick up their device as the first thing when they wake up in the mornings. And so it's, it obviously it's not a perfect sleep sensor, but it gives you enough texture of what's going on. 
Um, and then we, we never look at content, but what we look at is the distributions of how people behave. Um, and so it turns out, you know, this, this changes in how many people you interact with or, or how you communicate, and, and there's sort of these big shifts uh, when people are symptomatic versus not. Um, and the way the models work um, is we basically, it's sort of, a lot of the machine learning sort of production systems tend to use an ensemble approach. So we're pulling about 600, 700 features uh, that we get you know, every five minutes from your phone. Um, and then you know, some of those would be adjusted for you as an individual. Um, and then they all sort of go into this, this broad sort of you know, set of models that try to predict what's going on with the person. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the general framework. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in how the sensors are picking up the um, drug concentrations. Uh, just to put that in context, the pharmacogenomic side of things, which is one of my favourite interest areas, you know, you can have a vision where, you, uh, because it affects everyone eventually. And so the arrhythmia idea is great, and you can take that a little bit further and say, okay, we prevent someone from having a heart attack, they get put on to particular medications, the PMI can then further go on to assess those medications and their effectiveness with these sensors. We can monitor their exercise to see you know, how they're doing and tap that all in together to make one picture. So uh, how are the sensors picking up the drug concentrations in your body because this is where pharmacogenomics is sticking at the moment that we, we have these clinically actionable um, uh, recommendations but it's not yet really clear in practice and in individuals how effective they're going to be and, and this would be a fantastic I'll way let of Ray and Ram that. address this I think Ray uh, yours both are more drug response than concentration but go ahead yeah, so ours aren't detecting that drug concentration we just ask them when they're doing the task they're doing before or after they take their medicine so we ask people to do a certain set of tasks before they take their medicine and then one hour after they detect their medication, so we can look at a pharmacodynamic response, but not a drug concentration response. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll share with you later on a presentation with the actual slides. But we started by looking with pretty strong drugs that are, you know, really easy, relatively easy to detect, like epi or nitro. And here we started seeing very interesting things, like you see a really jump in the basic DC level of a, a PPG, for example, and you can really recognize the shape over a period of time. Obviously, this is an easy drug to detect, and we want to take it into other drugs. And I think the key, two key things that you touched on, one, to do it properly, it's not one sensor. You need input from a combination of sensors. And, and then you can go and start looking at things. Let's say it's some kind of a respiration drive. You can you know that in the last week, the average respiration rate at 9 a.m. has been um, X per uh, minute. Uh, but you have seen that today the activity level is the same. Uh, the heart rate went down and the respiration went up. That's, and if you know that this is the symptom that's associated with not taking the drug, and you can also compare it to HRV, and the surrounding things like, are you still at home? Has anything changed in your sleep pattern during that night? You'll be able to have a certain likelihood uh, that the person has not taken the drug, or the drug, uh, if you also look at it over time, that the drug effect has been uh, changing. Uh, this is a topic of research. This is not something proven. This is something that our partners have shown that there is a potential here to start detecting those drugs. Um, the other things that um, came out of the research, and I think it, it's worth sharing, is that often it's not just the specific numeric value that you're looking at, but it's really putting the drugs in kind of a um, very simple matrix, kind of going and saying blood pressure high, heart rate uh, low, and heart rate variability high. So if you just go and categorize each one of three or four sensors like this and create a matrix, changes in this matrix can be very, very telling uh, of uh, physiological changes during uh, over time. Thank you. John, you've been waiting patiently. Oh, thank you. Um, so, uh, great panel. Um, Ram, 
will Samsung agree to um, participate in a standards uh, process for um, uh, mobile health data? Uh, all the data right now is going and it's stored in the server and it's open. This is a research platform uh, and we have shared everything. So if you go to voiceofdata.io, all of the data is on it. And what we can do to share an open standard, I'm definitely open for it. So. I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I want to make a comment. It's kind of remedial and simpleton, but it, it relates to how it would roll out, whether it would be a disease state or multiple disease states or platform agnostic or not. From a consumer perspective, there is power in the fact that something of limit has value. So from a rollout perspective, it might make sense to start with one disease state because other people who are seeing it and seeing success in one disease state will then want it and clamor for it versus us going out asking people. There's a big difference between asking and saying, hey, we're here for everyone, and creating demand by limiting it to one disease state, which also helps the rollout from the perspective of the technology, almost beta, I know everybody hates that word, but testing it to make sure that it works. So just a simpleton comment, but there's some power in limiting it beyond just the technical aspects and the scientific aspects. There's a consumer behavior power there as well. I would say adoption is a proxy for value as, as many of the panelists here have shown with their products. Uh, and people weren't downloading it and using it. Clearly it wasn't useful and we've seen the exact opposite in just a few months. Yeah, f fully agree. It's not just focused from, you know, having a public win for this initiative is something we all want to see, but also from a consumer side. Uh, the Deb from uh, Evidation taught me the difference between data and information, and I really love quoting her. There's tons of data we are generating right now. What we are trying to do here is go and change this into useful information, a useful information for a researcher, and a useful information for the consumer. And this requires the focus that I think you've been talking about. Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, I'm Bob Rogers. I'm chief data scientist for Big Data Solutions at Intel. Wanted to thank you for making your comments about including the confidence of values in the uh, metadata for the information. And I wanted to get your thoughts on extending the use of confidence for measured values to inferences and also uh, information taken from unstructured data in the clinical side. Any, uh, any comments on that? I mean, it occurs to me that's an important extension of the idea. I could, I could maybe start on that and others could finish. Um, so, I mean, the, it is great to have high quality, precise data with good confidence intervals. No one would ever deny that, that it's wonderful. But at the same time, when we have a lot of evolving platforms and many things of that sort, we know that it is frequently difficult working within one modality to get very far. And my early parts of my career were spent with gene expression data, very noisy, very messy. A lot of the progress we made there was by incorporating orthogonal data, in this case genetics data, to find things that correlated between two data sets that would only represent real biology. Um, in this sort of uh, environment, we're going to see things where they're fairly similar. There are data which we get across the nation. We, uh, weather is mentioned frequently here. If you have something with people's health that relates to weather, you see a correlation there. It doesn't matter much about the precision with, of the measurement there. If you see that correlation, there's no reason it should correlate with weather unless it's actually reflecting some aspect of their behavior. Um, and similarly, you could triangulate across many other sorts of environmental measurements, and that will help to weed out some of the noise. It won't solve all your problems, but I suspect that uh, that is going to be part of the answer to getting value from this data. And that's, I think my understanding is that's how the large you know, the large, real, um, you know, web-scale data mining really works, is you look for signals in there across multiple orthogonal things which should be independent, uh, except when they actually have a real importance for someone's life. Right. That's, I think, a place to start, maybe. Our time's officially up, but I did want to get Ray to comment on that, since you probably have the most data in the most recent platform when you're dealing with this with 4,000 patients. Uh, what, 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 do you, uh, what do you have right now that you think is being underutilized from a confidence of data? Do you actually... You offer. Well, I think something that applies to all of us is uh, data on socialization. So knowing uh, where people are, so you can measure people with Parkinson's tend to be socially isolated, and uh, depression is uh, common as well. To the extent that you can get measures of people and how much they're socializing using GPS data, that's a very powerful concept. Can I have one concluding thought? Absolutely. So we're at Intel. You know Moore's laws. You know describe you know the increases in productivity and uh, computing power. You know, in drug development, clinical research, we follow the opposite. We follow Ebrum's law that, you know, the amount of money and productivity in drug development has been uh, decreasing uh, for a generation. 
I would just say, you know, given that we have $130 per participant in this study, it's a great opportunity to use technology to disrupt the way we currently uh, do clinical research. If we're going to do a million-person study, we're going to have people go into clinical sites to uh, do things as we've done in the past. That's not the way to do it. There have been ample technologies that can uh, change, transform the way we're doing uh, uh, research and engage large numbers of participants in very cost-effective ways. Excellent. That's a perfect concluding comment. Thank you very much. Who's going to be moderating our final session before the break? Oh. All right. As people gather here, we're going to use the time as efficiently as possible because we've got 45 minutes and we have a cohort, a big cohort on this panel that uh, is really going to share a little bit about use cases and take what we've done over the last few days and, and uh, last day and a half, actually, and talk about how we might actually utilize a lot of the things that we've talked about in specific use cases. So with that, let me go ahead and just give you a quick sense of, of who I am. Um, my name is Sue Siegel. I'm CEO at GE Ventures and Healthy Imagination. I've spent the last 32 years um, in the world of life sciences and healthcare, and really focused on looking at breakthrough technologies and or solutions that can truly impact the world of health. And so I have to say I've been very, very excited as it relates to being able to participate on the working group and being asked to actually, in, invited to participate on the working group because this sort of brings together so many different things that in fact can truly help impact health, not only with some of the use cases you're gonna hear today, but frankly around prevention. So one thing I would say is I also come at this from a real business aspect. Um, so the research is absolutely core, but the translation to be able to utilize this is really imperative. Having been um, a corporate executive and also a venture capitalist, one of the things that I have to say, and I'll repeat it, and, and, and Francis actually uh, started to elicit this uh, in the last couple of panels, and that is that you really have to start applying this into use cases. And if that's the case, how do you go about doing that? One thing that I, and, and Deb mentioned this, in the molecular diagnostic space, which was a very new space around blood-based biomarkers that came out of genetics, the Human Genome Project, everybody rushed into that, and there was a huge amount of funding that went into that particular space at the initial stages. What happened during that sort of um, evolution of the industry, as powerful it is, as it is, and how strong it's actually made the oncology area, was this lack of guidelines, um, true regulatory um, agreement and clarity, and in addition to that, lack of sort of guidelines around reimbursement. And one of the things I would really invoke for us to do on the working group and as a community, is make sure that those inputs are really coming into the equation because you don't want a flight of venture capitalists leaving the field, which is what happened in molecular diagnostics, because of uncertainty around regulations and reimbursement. I cannot stress that enough. So I'm so um, relieved to see that the way that this working group has actually been put together brings together those kind of inputs I would also really exhort the community to continue to push for that kind of engagement right up front to get the clarity so that we can, in fact, have a very, very successful outcome to the PMI. Um, with that, what I would say is what we're going to talk about is use cases. And you see here a number of folks that you've already seen um, over the course of the last day and a half on various panels. The way we've decided to structure this in the short amount of time that we've got is as follows. We have four use cases that we're going to cover. And those are going to be done by Dr. Ida Sim. One is uh, cardiovascular disease, and you'll start first. Uh, the second one is going to be um, Dr. Gary Bennett around um, obesity. And then we'll go to, and keeping it all in the metabolic sort of area, we'll go to the world of diabetes with Dr. Um, Anand Iyer. And then, last but not the least, we'll have Michael Jarrett talk a little bit about environmental exposures. Everyone's going to do this really fast. <laughs> last but not the least, we'll go through then over the last day and a half, really taking some of the learnings from the various panels and consolidating that. And that's going to be done by Rhoda Au, and she'll go first, and then Arthur Stone. 
to finalize this, we'll do a lightning round of what advice would each of these panelists give to the PMI when you have to think about which variables would you utilize in this world of, of personalized medicine, uh, uh, precision medicine initiative, and, and, and give an example of why. So we'll try to do that very quickly. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ida. All right, a lightning use case. Um, the question is, how can mobile health be an effective part of real-time frontline care? I am a primary care physician. Uh, we have a product called Link that uh, we built out at OpenM Health to work out our use cases. That was the only way we were going to define what we were doing. Uh, we have a pilot right now that's run by uh, Mike McConnell, uh, preventive cardiology at Stanford. So the use case here is blood pressure control. Um, I'd say I want to start somebody on a blood pressure medicine. How do I, you know, get their blood pressure and titrate in a timely fashion with as uh, as as uh, uh, greatest efficiency both for me and the patient. So the idea is that uh, I want to be able to prescribe M Health data the way I prescribe and order any other data. Okay, so here I'm sitting with the patient and I can say, hey, I want you to check your blood pressure every day, you know, for the next three weeks, starting on a certain day, here are the limits, you know, here are the alert limits, um, and yeah, you know, let's check your heart rate too, and, and then I want to be notified of the average heart rate, you know, a week or two or three weeks out, okay? Just like I order a potassium, just like I order a CT scan, I hit order and boom, I'm done. I don't want to know, are you on a Fitbit or I things or, you know, what I don't want to deal with that because I have all these other things to need, I need to do as a doctor. We can also have a discussion with the patient. What is your moderate activity level that you want to achieve? 150 minutes is, you know, not reasonable. Maybe, you know, after a discussion, maybe it's 80 minutes. Maybe it's 20 minutes. But, but what we need here is technology that supports a conversation between the clinician and the patient. Not anything prescriptive, but tools to help us be better doctors and be better uh, patients and be better partners. So we prescribe the data together so we know what data we want, why we want it, and what we're going to do with it. That's what I teach my residents, right? Don't order something if you don't know what you want to do with it. Patient goes home, they can have an app on their phone, whether it's iOS or Android, uh, then they're helped to bring their own device, and of course it is a restricted set of devices. They get help onboarding because you never just throw technology at them. They track. Um, uh, if there is a high blood pressure, for example, if the alerts are, are uh, exceeded, then there's a message that goes back to the EHR. We've worked with a company called Catalyze to build an HL7V2 feed. Okay, so it's got to be part of the workflow of the clinician. No extra website, no extra sign-in. Uh, there's visualization, very carefully done with lots of user uh, interaction studies, both for the patient and the doctor. Um, and I can easily reset data prescription and notification parameters, you know, to just get the cycle over again. It makes mHealth part of the way we do care. It makes mHealth part of what I do with my patients in a conversation. It supports both them in their self-care and me in my clinical care. Uh, and that's what, we, that's what we need to do. Um, so just very quickly, if we, you know, talking about uh, uh, variables, these are ones that I think we can do today. Um, the ones that we might do in the quote unquote next internet cycle, don't know how long that is, but, uh, and then, you know, way out there. So some ideas about things we might want to capture, but I would think we also want to be talking about data capture not independent of itself, but as part of an intervention and as part of, uh, people have mentioned earlier before, uh, as part of formal end of one studies to not just be interventional, but also be investigative at the same time that we capture data. Thanks. Thanks, Ida. Let's go to Gary. So I'm going to be brave and try to do this without slides. Um, bear with me. Pray for me. Um, so, here, so, um, so in the area of obesity treatment, I would argue that in the last 20 or 25 years, we have not really moved the needle dramatically on, on our ability to make large, create large weight loss outcomes. We've gotten much more sophisticated in creating lower intensity interventions and just being able to disseminate them more widely. But in terms of how much weight we can produce and sustain over a longer period of time, um, we, we probably have not done as much as we can. That said, there are a variety of different dietary approaches to weight loss. They're combinations of dietary and physical activity, purely physical activity uh, treatments, and we don't know which, which treatments work best for which patients. Uh, similarly, we have l probably literally hundreds of behavioral interventions um, which are designed to help patients to essentially follow these prescriptions over some period of time, and we don't know which of these behavioral interventions, most of which have been funded by the NIH, will work for which patients. Um, so what, I, what I'd envision, and I think this is all possible with current day technology, 
and also possible within a 12 to 18 month time span, uh, is, a, is a use case such that we would be able to predict which specific diets um, or combinations of diets and activity work best for which patients, um, both for initial weight losses to maximize those weight losses and for long-term uh, maintenance of those weight losses. Um, those predictions should be able to be made with uh, input of relatively limited data. I'm imagining the kind of data that people are already collecting in their everyday lives. We should be able to predict which types of metrics people are able to self-monitor over time. So, some t so in some studies we've shown that just standing on a scale each day and weighing yourself can produce 7% weight loss in six months. Other studies have shown that writing a happy face, you know, at the top of your, on the top of your desk planners is enough self-monitoring for some people, and other people need to track calorie, uh, calorie down in a very granular level. So we should be able to predict which, which people will engage with which types of self-monitoring over the extended time horizon that's necessary to produce and sustain weight losses. Um, this is doubly important for patients, many of which have, uh, have chronic comorbidities, so we should be able to also predict which patients are going to do best who have hypertension and diabetes self-management. If this could be embedded into the annual checkup, um, which I think we have good data now to suggest is not particularly useful as it currently stands, but if it was reformulated around the idea of focusing on prevention around the, the major risk factors for chronic disease or self-management for existing uh, chronic comorbidities, and we were able to have patients come in with their providers with the data they already have, make predictions about which diets, physical activities, combinations thereof, which behavioral interventions that we already have existing today work best for which patients, roll them out, um, then I think we'd really have something. I think we can do that in 12 to 18 months. What we need uh, in terms of data uh, for today, I think we have, uh, we have arguably the best data on diet and physical activity, the most data in the health space in diet and physical activity. Reconciling those, those data will be challenging, but is not insurmountable. We also have a host of network connected scales that would allow us access to weight data to be able to track those kinds of things. The next step, I think, is completely passive uh, measurement of diet. I think that, and by completely passive, I mean not taking a picture because that essentially requires a behavioral intervention to remind you to take the picture every time you're eating, particularly when you're out with friends. Um, I mean completely passive uh, measurement of diet, perhaps through uh, heart rate, respiration, uh, other, other kinds of things like that. Um, and if we could get there in a three to five a year time horizon, then I think we'd be even better. Thank you. Awesome. All right. I think, Anand, you're up, and this is going to be about diabetes. So just picking off of what we talked about yesterday, I thought I'd actually walk you through the, the flow of a, of a patient. So uh, imagine a fictitious patient, Rose. Um, she's struggling with her diabetes. Uh, her A1C is elevated for the last uh, two years. Uh, she's on uh, multiple daily injections of insulin and orals. Um, she doesn't do much activity. Uh, and she's struggling overall, uh, feeling pretty down about herself uh, and, and thinks that she can do better. She sees her doctor, her doctor uh, refills her Genuvia, refills her Lantus, and puts her on a new drug called Blue Star. And, and, and like all drugs, it's got an NDC code and it's prescribed. So for me, I'd, uh, prescription is really a prescription. It goes to the pharmacy. It's not just the word prescription because it's reimbursed, if you would. So the pharmacy dispenses Ida, a co uh, Ida. A pharmacy dispenses Rose a code. Um, um, and Ida on the mind. And, uh, and, and she takes that code and she goes to the iTunes, uh, Android market, whatever, downloads the software, fills in her profile, gets started with her Blue Star software. So uh, day one, uh, you know, she wakes up in the morning and, uh, and she tests her glucose and, uh, and it's high. The system rewards her, of course, for testing because it's great that she tested. She engaged with her, with her diabetes. But it then coaches her specifically on how to bring that high glucose down. And of course, her instructions are tailored to her medication regimen, her comorbid history, and her, uh, her uh, uh, medical history, family history stuff. So her feedback and, and somebody else's feedback are necessarily different. Um, it works with her uh, medication. She can set up her reminders as she does. It actually does her insulin titration calculations based on the meals she consumes, which are easily entered either directly as carbs or they're entered uh, via a, a food database or, or, or emerging techniques where she actually gets restaurant help and, and meal suggestions based on her glucose, which is all there in the product today. Anyway, so it helps her with that. It helps her manage her activities. And she engages with this thing on average uh, if you take it across all uh, active and inactive patients on any given day, it's one to two uses per day, which is fascinating because the type 2 patients test on average 2.3 times a week. The statistics from Roche, Abbott, Bear, and J&J. &J. Um, we're seeing patients who engage on any given day, like Ruth, they test about, oh, sorry, they check in with their Blue Star application five to seven times a day. Remember, the engaged, uh, the engaged patient 
is the blockbuster drug of the 21st century. We get them to do what they need to do and all of a sudden 90% of our problems go away. Okay? So she continues to use it. Uh, her, her, uh, uh, she has this consistent problem of, of uh, uh, high postprandial sugars after lunches. Um, and on the third day, it actually tells her, hey, this is good, I'm glad you tested, but here's three things you need to do when you eat out. Here's meal recommendations, here's portion control, et cetera. So it really works with her in a manner that she likes to work with. Let's talk about the outcomes. Uh, a 2.81C reduction, all the clinical trials in real life, we're actually seeing people who start uh, above 10, they're dropping about three and a half points in the first 90 days, which is pretty fascinating because that's not achieved by drugs alone. It's just, it's unheard of. Um, they're engaging five to seven times a day. We gave all our data to Milliman. We're looking at about a $390 to $630 per patient per month to uh, uh, Sue's point. It has to be economically viable. So it's a $390 to $630 per patient per month cost savings. A large part of that cost savings is because of a 58 to 65% reduction in ER visits and admits that we've observed, not just in clinical trials, but in real life. And so at the end of the day, now she has a tool that works with her uh, regimen, her preferences that allows her to take control, and uh, she's on her way to a, to a, to a better life. So that's diabetes and Blue Star. Excellent. <clears throat> Ida, that would have been okay if it was you, actually, because you were on your way. All right, now we're going to go to the environmental factors. Thank you. I, I did have some slides, but I decided, uh, seeing these wonderful presentations, I'd try to emulate that and, and not use them. Uh, so my case was improving uh, prenatal and neonatal uh, health by examining the exposome. And yesterday we talked about the exposome as being the life course of exposures from conception to death and how difficult that was to measure. The good news is for this exposure window, it's somewhat easier because it's going to encompass the pregnancy and then the early life of the child. So there is the opportunity to do a very comprehensive assessment for a relatively short window where we don't have to go back and try to impute exposures uh, 30 years ago as we might for cancer. So the first needs, and I said this yesterday, location, location, location. If we have the location, we can infer many exposures from existing databases or databases that we can model for the entire country at a relatively minor cost. I say relatively on a $250 million initiative because it's not cheap to develop national level of noise models or air pollution models, but it would be on the order of, you know, a few million dollars, not tens or 20, 20 10 or 20 million dollars to do that. So I think that's, that's, that's critical, but we shouldn't underestimate um, the importance of doing the proper modeling. Now, in terms of picking the exposures, this is something that follows on a workshop that was held uh, at NIHS in February that was organized by David Balshaw. Um, we're writing a paper on how you would target specific exposures. And the criteria that we've used are looking for biologic plausibility. Is this something that in the past or in, um, by analogy, we, we have some biologic plausibility? Is there a known or surmised pathway of the exposure to the human receptor? is there the capacity of this exposure to affect large populations? So we're not just going after some very small occupational exposure. Um, and is there feasibility of measurement in large groups, and if not measurement, modeled data? So those are criteria that we could use for honing down. And I have a table that I can share for the proceedings that uh, covers many of the specific exposures. So if I was going to say what we would want to do in the next 18 months, I'd say collect location activity and, and physical activity data on everyone. Um, evaluate currently available apps for environmental exposure for noise, electromagnetic radiation, temperature, trip, travel, others, and see how these compare to research grade instruments so that we do some, the you know, idea of, of validation study I think is critical here. Um, deploy the external sen sensors so getting those sensors that I talked about yesterday that might be more expensive, but doing that on sentinel participants in sentinel neighborhoods. And the reason for doing that is we can statistically, if we have the gold standard information, adjust our main models where we're degrading that to information we might have on a million people with a relatively smaller sample that is going to be a much richer data set. And um, this can be used for regression calibration, exposure modeling, et cetera. So that is what I would recommend over the next 18 months, and I'd be happy to discuss specific exposures and what's available. But in the interest of time, I'll just end there.
Yeah, thank you. I uh, wish we had a little bit more time, and I'm sure some folks will have questions around that. Let's move to Rhoda and Arthur now. And Rhoda, you were going to sort of give a little bit of a um, view over the last day and a half of some of the things we learned, particularly around the, some of the variables that we would be talking about as it relates to incorporating them into the PMI. Um, yeah, so I have the envious task of summarizing about six hours worth in about five minutes. So I wrote it down, and I'm going to read it to you. Um, and in the interest that you don't have to speed write, I made copies. I made a few copies to, to give to you. All right. So first, recruitment. No one strategy will be effective. We'll need a multi-tiered one that will speak to the personal interests of the participant. Essentially, to meet the goals of the Precision Medicine initi Initiative, one needs to think about precision subject targeting and the methods for doing so. Since panelists drew from their experience, the methods included testing of different methods within the internal capacity of existing projects. This is not simply related to funding. It's also to the internal expertise that we had to draw from. So thus, there is the use of online strategies via email, social media, for samples that are smartphone connected, phone, and snail mail. The take home from all these strategies is making it personal matters for getting subjects to opt in. What has not been widely used to date is how existing search technologies, such as those used by Google, Amazon, and Facebook, can be used to make this approach more easily scalable. And it can be coupled with more traditional approaches to create a cost-effective, labor-efficient, blended approach that can create a precision subject recruitment strategy. OK, now I'm going to move on to data collection. Across the different panels, there were multiple examples of how mobile technologies are currently being used to measure heart health, physical activity, and location, which combine to measure different outcomes of interest. Use of devices can likely be deployed for any sub-population, but, we'll, but will also require proper training and support. Keeping it as simple as possible is best. Additionally, the home providers, uh, the home provides an opportunity to collect rich data more passively and potentially less burdensome to some participants. As poor health outcomes increase, mobility decreases. Thus, embedded technologies in the home done in a way that is not personally intrusive may be able to capture much of the important data needed for those who are at higher risk for various chronic diseases. Questionnaires administered by various methods remain another method for data collection that can be done via smartphone apps or other off-site options, including, including current traditional methods of email, phone, and snail mail. Defining what the outcome goals is really important, and essentially there are two major ones discussed. One that is disease-focused approach that is implied in the Precision Medi Medicine Initiative where detection and treatment of disease is of central concern. And that's where we talk about patients. The other major outcome is what could be thought of as precision health. The focus here is less on disease monitoring treatment and more on disease prevention. Monitoring for preclinical symptoms and deploying interventions before traditional clinical interventions would be warranted. So that would be where we're talking about participants. The value proposition to the participant will define the level of burden they will be willing to assume. Having a specific health concern will increase subject motivation, motivation to participate and stickiness. The value is not limited to whether the person has a specific health concern. If we keep a longitudinal perspective in mind and achieve the right personalized interaction, we can achieve willingness for increased levels of participation and stickiness. The primary concerns related to data collection are security and confidentiality. Protecting personal privacy is critical, and ensuring capacity to do so will be essential. Now I move on to data management analysis. For many of the existing large-scale studies, there is already a richness of data that remain untapped. Adding e-data collection is an exponential increase that goes well beyond what the genetics field has even opened up. Thinking of this as the earliest stages of the Human Phenome Project is an apt description of where we are today. But the analytics need to go beyond what is being done in the genomics realm. What has hampered genetic studies to date that relied on pooled data from multiple studies are effective data harmonization tools. In fact, the charge consortia do not share data in the true sense. They also conduct separate analyses and then do meta-analyses to combine their findings. We don't want to repeat our same mistakes. 
One big one is not to have a clear data sharing policy up front for this new initiative. This will require creating a new culture for the research community at large, but beyond that, what is also needed are data integration and visualization tools. And while there is some capacity for doing this within academics, it pales compared to the resources available in private industry. In parallel are the analytics that need to be developed to make sense of all the data. Currently derived measures are based on gold standards that have been established using old data collection method. It is likely that new gold standards will emerge, but for this to happen will require significant resources devoted to building those analytics. The approach for analysis to balance between what we know and what we probably can't even imagine. Phew. Thank you. <laughs> now I have recommendations, but I'll wait. No. <laughs> All right, thank you. Arthur. Yes, I, I took a different approach than Rhoda. It's not nearly so organized, so bear with me. What I did was I looked through my notes on the sessions that I was supposed to be keeping track on, including the session I was in, which is why I was taking notes. Um, and, and there were four words that uh, struck me that, uh, that went through these sessions. One was metrics, that is, what are the actual metrics or in another parlance, endpoints that are going to be derived from all of the data that will be collected by the mobile devices. So metrics. Second was meaning. Are the, metri or are the endpoints, the metrics that we have, are they going to be meaningful to either patients or in terms of the prediction of health outcomes of interest? And I think a lot of people raise the issue that we don't really know a lot of things. Um, third was burden. How will the data collection um, impact burden, and certainly there's a wide range. A lot of the devices we're talking about will passively do things. Uh, but a lot of the other kinds of things that we would like to include with mobile devices, including capturing self-report data, or blood pressure data, or glucometry, or a whole variety of things, are intrusive and burdensome. And we have to think about how will that interact with our ability to keep this sample going over many years. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing was the monitoring period. How long will we be monitoring people um, with various kinds of mobile technologies? And I think I, in reflecting on that, I think these are terrific themes, it, what I'd like to do is um, provide for the panel what I think is a distinction in how to think about this. Um, I think with this passive monitoring, there's no issue. You can just keep people monitoring as long as you like, hopefully providing them the proper incentives. But for more burdensome monitoring, like I said, for self-report, for blood pressure, et cetera, I think that there, there are going to be some important questions that come up. And so there are two scenarios that I think about in terms of what the PMI initiative is trying to do. One is, are we trying to characterize people and environments over a period of time which we will then use to interact with their genomic profiles, with their metabolic profiles in a long-term prediction of disease. So that's one kind of way of characterizing people and perhaps what, for that you want to monitor people for some reasonable period of time like a day, a week, a month and you can do that even with the more burdensome profiles but we need to know how long do you need to monitor people in order to have a reliable um, a measure from, from that? The second kind of way of thinking about this is, are we trying to predict the health outcomes from the very granular data? Do we really need to know that there was a spike in blood pressure because there was an argument with a spouse or because someone lost their job? Do we need to be tracking that continuously um, I don't think that we can track some of these things continuously for obvious reasons, but I think we need to look back and say, from, a, from what we know about what drives health and morbidity, uh, what are the things that we want to look at, and then which of these models does the PMI initiative want to adopt, or is it some version of both? Because it will play importantly into the design, into these bursts that I mentioned the other yesterday, or continuous monitoring. So I think the panel needs to be thinking about that from a practical point of view and from a science point of view in terms of the metrics, the meaning, the burden. Thank you. Well done. All right, so um, what I'm going to do now, because we don't have very much time left, is really go through 
specifically the recommendations on the question that we were asked to answer specifically, which is, if you were designing the PMI, what would be the core tech-based variables that should be collected on anyone, everyone? And which tech-based variables should be untamed on specific subgroups? Which subgroups and why? So quickly as possible, Gary, do you want to kick off? Sure, but I may go rogue just a little bit. Um, so I, I, I think uh, I have a feature on my blog that I call a wearable a day because there's a wearable a day. And at the risk of, of ostracizing myself from my friends and who are the device makers in the room, I think a study branded wearable is realistic that would, that you know, effectively Showmate can do this at scale for about 12 or $13. I suspect NIH could get them to do it for, for even less. It would record uh, raw accelerometer data, probably um, GSR, probably heart rate. You could probably get a GPS and maybe even BP depending on where you put it. I think you could get this at under $15 for at the scale we're talking about and that could be, I'd want Johnny Ive to do the design to tell me which color of fluorescent, yeah, which fluorescent color um, would be successful. I, I, I think I'm envisioning people walking around saying, what is that you have on your arm? And, and the participants saying, well, I'm a member of the, the national PMI, right? Uh, what you can go sign up and get yours tomorrow. And I think that that could be a persistent kind of, of measure uh, that we update over time as new sensors come on board. And the friends in the room could, could give the specifications for that kind of a wearable. The other thing I'll say very quickly is that I think we need to capture uh, the ISP, the modem, the router, um, this is the decidedly un unsexy variables, but all of the all of the data at onboarding that um, effectively represents how a person connects to the internet. Because uh, Eric's point about technical support cannot be overstated. The biggest problem that's going to happen in the first two months of implementation are the 50,000 telephone calls that ask you about what someone's Wi-Fi password is. Right? The technical support considerations here are non-trivial, and the more data that you can collect at onboarding, uh, the better. Thank you, Michael. Well, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I'm sort of torn, though, between how much we should rely on the cell phones or separate instruments initially. And I guess my preference would be to take applications that can be loaded onto cell phones that people are already carrying en masse and to perhaps have a, a smaller number of cell phones to give to people that were not yet on a smartphone. Um, and a, as I mentioned earlier, I think the location, the physical activity are the two most critical. If we could get uh, mode detection, that would certainly be, you know, looking at different types of trips. It's a critical component for many types of exposure, stress, physical activity, air pollution, noise. That would be another one that I would like to see early on. Uh, I think the, the biophysical measures um, that Gary mentioned are all very worthy of, of inclusion. But if it did involve a separate instrument, I would, I would think maybe doing the pilot study on that to make sure that there's user acceptance, that they're willing to wear this. Because as Donna Sprouts brought up yesterday, different groups are going to have different acceptance of different types of instruments. And we don't know what that is yet, so. OK, thank you. Um, Anand? Yes, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm closer to where uh, Ram Fish was, which is, um, I think, I think the danger we have in front of ourselves is we can collect anything because we can, uh, not because we should. And I think we need to define a domain. What do we want this first experiment to be? What do we want the outcomes of this first experiment to be? But let's pick a domain, or maybe two domains, but really don't go beyond that. So is it what he said as an example? Is it, I want to be able to detect uh, arrhythmias and, and drive costs down for heart patients? Is that I want to do something in diabetes and pick something that's really easily, easily measurable and that has an end state that I want to drop A1Cs in the country for these million people by two points. That's easy to do. Um, or do I want to do something for, you know, uh, asthma or whatever the condition is? But I think if we set the domain, then within that domain there are primary variables that we're going to have to measure. It's just, it's, it is what it is. And at that point in time, the choice of devices, I think, will be dictated by we have this... Um, we have this architecture, which is what we call uh, brought in, beamed in, and built in. And brought in says, yeah, I can bring in a, any glucometer, and I can type in my value into my app. It's done. I have interoperability for free. Beamed in says it's Bluetooth, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Ant, what, whatever your favorite wireless protocol is. And of course, built in is you give them a device. You give them that device that has got the things that you want to measure out of it, right? And so you use that brought in, beamed in, built in. I think those are three 
effective levers because at the end of the day, we can talk about data and taxonomy and all the things that was discussed, but if it's a deterrent and they don't use it because they're not feeling like they're able to put in what they want to put in, then they'll stop. You'll stop collecting any data and then your experiment goes out the door. And so I think first, set the domain. Second, the domain itself dictates these three strategies on devices. And then you have the primary and secondary data that you need to collect. But I think if you do that with a focused intent of a million people, I think this has a, an unbelievable shot of succeeding that then sets the, now they're gonna, you're going to be funded billions of dollars to expand this uh, uh, in, in ways. And I'm a dreamer, but uh, everything I've dreamed about has come true in my life. And so why stop now, right? <laughs> May it be true. All right. Rhoda, over to you. All right. So I take a different approach, device agnostic. I think we should collect physical activity, sleep, environmental exposure, heart health, and diet. And why? Because they're known to significantly impact health. Uh, they're common to everybody, uh, independent of whether you have a medical or prevention focus. They're relevant. So they have high proposition value to participants. And for lifestyle behaviors, which are poorly assessed with current methods, I think the return on investment is likely to going to be higher. Uh, there are going to be add-on metrics that can be derived from this core collection of these metrics. Um, in terms of subgroups, before I get into that, what I like to do is, because Jeff K. can't say it for himself, uh, he reminded me that there is, with greater precision, a less need for greater numbers. So we can actually get away with fewer numbers when we start to think about clusters. So in a one million person cohort means lots of subgroups. But some of the subgroups, if you ask me, to think about targeting, aging in general, brain aging in particular, I realize that's a little self-serving, uh, because cognitive impairment and decline, Alzheimer's disease and traumatic brain injury are high concern, and um, much is still unknown, cancer, obesity, diabetes, and why the value participants uh, proposition to participants for all of these, I think, are high. Now, something that wasn't actually mentioned that I think we need to think about is collection of biological samples. Uh, beyond no metrics, collection and storage of biological samples um, right now are not done electronically, and I think that's something we have to put at least in development. Um, obviously, we've talked about the need for e-capture of diet better. I think we need to put that on the development platform now. Um, and then there's the integration across all uh, um, devices, both mobile and in a home. Thank you. Arthur. Not surprisingly, I'm going to advocate for a variety of self-report domains to be collected. <laughs> I don't know what the frequency should be because, I mean, I'd like to see end of day with intensive bursts of EMA within the day. That's very tough. It might even be that weekly is enough, once a week over a very long period. But the domains that I think should be collected our, our symptoms, our um, affective responses that people are having, our medication use, because none of that's getting collected so far as far as I'm hearing, as well as um, activities of daily living. All of this has to be done very, very quickly. It can be done quickly in a matter of two minutes. I imagine it could be done through the mobile device, but it doesn't need to be. It could be done uh, via people's connections with the internet even with IVRS systems, but this kind of information is critical to, one, predicting later health events, and two, for understanding all of the other passive monitoring. Okay, Ida, you've got final input here. I'm not sure you're going to add much. So, so the domain that, that I have is primary care. <laughs> that's, that's what I am. Um, so, yeah, the cardiovascular, heart health, blood pressure, weight. Um, I think sleep is critical, location activity, people have said that. I'd also argue for mobility, which is a little different than activity. You know, many of our patients have DJD and, you know, we can't move because it's hurting. So then self-report becomes very important. I think the lived experience is very important. I think we need a lot more methods about that, right? But um, I think pain and fatigue are the ones I see a lot of in, in, in primary care and stress and affect. Um, diet, I think we need some diet, but I think we want to be careful about what we really want to collect. I'm particularly interested in salt, but you know, there may be, you can't just collect like all of diet. So I think we need to dive down a little bit on that. And then medication adherence, Arthur, I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's really important. We're going to get EHR data, we're going to find out they're on all these medications, and we know they're not actually really on all those medications. Uh, it's a huge, huge part of how people really manage their health, and tricky thing to do, but I think we might want to put it on there. Okay, Michael, you said you wanted... Yeah, I just to wanted... To, there, there's one type of sensors we haven't talked about, and for doing large-scale studies, it's remote sensing, so satellite imagery, 
and that's available either through the private sector, with Google, but also through NASA. And NASA already funds uh, health studies that are based based on remote sensing imagery. So there's a chance for a partnership with an organization that's the leading organization in the world for developing remote sensing, and uh, the United States already has a strategic advantage in that area. So it's an opportunity, I think, to get nationwide coverages on everything from temperature to green space to air pollution that can then be assigned consistently across a very large cohort without having to worry about the vagaries of small area data collection. I think that's something that we should consider in our first phase as well. All right, thank you. So as you can see, there is absolute commonality amongst the entire panel. <laughs> and that really is why the PMI, I think, really has to pull together the type of um, call to action that uh, Francis had actually mentioned earlier, which is, Define the actual disease state. Define what you're looking for, and then be a bit prescriptive as to what is needed. Because all of us are going to have a different opinion for each of our specific areas. And in order to really get to an actual outcome that I think we all want to be able to prove from not only diagnosis all the way to prevention, we've got to come up with what, that's, what that actual disease state and study is going to be. So um, one other thing I will add, which is there are the performance metrics that have been talked about throughout, and then there are the clinical metrics that we really do need to have to differentiate. And I can't urge enough, particularly around the clinical measures, that we start to get some definition as it relates to what is going to be required for regulatory efforts and what is going to be required for reimbursement efforts. Because if we really want to take them into utility, we have to prove validity, and then we have to prove utility. So I, I, I say it over and over again only because $4 billion has been actually invested by venture capitalists last year into the world of digital health. When you start to look at the rate and pace of investment already today in this particular, we're already exceeding that in 2015. If we want to continue that pace and want to see these, what we've been talking about today and over the last day and a half come to fruition, we need to have the clarity that needs to come out of this kind of leadership, to be perfectly frank, and then really encourage the standardization that we've been hearing about over time. So with that, I'll stop, and we have about a minute or two to be able to actually take some questions either from the panel or from the audience. Very brief. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make a brief, brief comment. It's interesting that I think Art was the only one who used the word genetics. Um, so PMI is, was, I mean, precision medicine, I think, actually is fundamentally thought of as the, how genomics really can tell us a lot about individuals. Um, so I, I think that we need to think more about how these kinds of data will relate to the genomics data. And so, for example, um, we should be looking for rare variants of activity. So people who, for example, uh, wouldn't it be nice to know uh, people who can sleep for two hours but be uh, highly active for months at a time. Uh, and they have a particular... <laughs> Well, that, and, then, and then they go and have a, a four beers and, uh, uh, and ruin that. But, but I think that, they're, they're, you know, we talked, it was a, a nice framing function to say, you know, what papers would appear in the New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA. But also let's think about science and nature and to, to sort of discover fundamental relationships between these unique, or ne unique opportunity to quantify human activity and then look at the, gen the genome and its relationship to how, you know, how those two interact and, and the exposome and so forth. So. Thank you. Um, definitely, I, I think everybody wanted to be, a, there, there's just a common view that genetics is the underlying factor and all of these are going to get hooked up. I mean, and if it's not, then I think the PMI needs to really make sure that's been made very, very clear. So thank you for bringing it up on this side, and then we'll, I think we're going to have to take just one question. Kathy, you're up, right? Yeah. So, Go ahead. Uh, just a quick comment regarding potential um, groups of interest. Our best participants in Nurses Health Study 3 are actually not sick people. They are pregnant women and women who are trying to get pregnant. 
And um, so what, thinking of what can you accomplish within 18 months, human pregnancy is actually shorter than 18 months. So uh, if you are able to recruit a, uh, even a few thousand, doesn't have to be one million pregnant women, of course, but uh, if you're able to recruit even a few thousand pregnant women and couples trying to become pregnant, uh, that is something that you can probably deliver outcomes on uh, heart disease and biologic outcomes within one year. All right, thank you. With that, say thank you to the panel, and we'll move to Kathy. So I have a couple of wrap-up slides, if I could get them up. Um, so thank you all very much. This has been a really stimulating day and a half. I certainly have learned a tremendous amount, and I think that the input that we've gotten here um, will be super valuable for the working group as we go into our deliberations this afternoon. So I'm going to do a quick um, summary of what we uh, talked about over the course of the last day and a half. We started off with um, Jessica Mega talking about the expanding definition of mobile um, beyond our phones, which are always uh, very near to us and dear to us, uh, to technologies and uh, a wearable technologies. She talked about the um, broad range of technologies to monitor disease processes and to provide that information back to uh, both participants and providers in order to improve health. And she talked about um, really the false dichotomy between population health and personal health and how um, mobile technologies are really helping to bring that together. In our first session, we talked about um, how participants like using mobile technologies and uh, figuring out how to make that a real benefit of participation in the cohort will be important to us. Um, we talked about um, the ability of technologies to integrate different kinds of tests and measures more easily than before, uh, cognitive performance, sleep, self-reported data, et cetera, and those came up throughout the course of the uh, last day and a half. We talked about being able to use these technologies to push data back to participants, and we know from our survey and from, um, from the input that we've gotten throughout this entire process that participants want to get data back, not only about themselves, but about the entire uh, 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 set of participants in the cohort. Um, from the lessons learned from existing cohorts, it was not clear on the impact of using mobile technologies on recruitment and retention, and that will be an important piece of information that we can gather in the early days of the cohort. And then um, some discussion about privacy and security, and certainly a real focus on that, although there are not um, specific negative impacts uh, to date, even from the huge breach um, that we have all suffered at the Office of Personnel Management. <clears throat> um, our second session was on participant engagement and talking about getting participant feedback early and often, what kinds of technologies can we deploy that people will uh, enjoy wearing and that won't be disruptive uh, to their lives. We talked about leveraging um, existing and building new social networks based on these technology platforms um, and talking about using social support to sustain engagement um, but allowing participants to personalize that social support in terms of how much is enough and how much might be too much. And then um, also uh, repeatedly throughout the last day and a half talking about using citizen science principles to engage participants over time. So our third session was on measuring the environment, and this has been um, particularly perplexing for me in terms of understanding exactly um, what is measurable and what um, value it might have. And so this session was particularly interested, interesting to me. So environmental measures, uh, people talk, the panelists talked about activity and location being key, um, and that there are, uh, um, uh, there are, um, a, there's a need to evaluate some of the applications for measuring noise, travel, and other exposures. There was a lot of discussion about the home as the hub. It's a place where we spend a lot of our time. It's a, the place where we um, are often uh, sick, stay when we're sick, and uh, where we get a lot of our exposures. And so having something that's not necessarily wearable but that hangs out in our house uh, is an interesting idea, along with some of the um, 
community sensors that are in place now in various uh, cities across the United States that can feed data in as well. In terms of uh, variables um, that are measurable with M technologies for behavior, there were uh, presentations about using um, wireless sensing and soft electronics. So rather than a hard and inflexible device, something that might be uh, more comfortable to wear and thus um, sustained for longer periods of time. We talked about um, making sure that our mobile technologies have minimal burden, um, that we uh, get continuous data feeds, that that data is robust and that it is useful. Um, passive sensing is certainly here. We learned that uh, students party now on Wednesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> Only at Dartmouth. <laughs> Only at Dartmouth. Um, maybe this is why my son doesn't answer his phone on Wednesday nights. Um, we talked about the importance of self-reported data and um, being able to measure internal states where really only the participant is able to describe those to you effectively, um, stress, pain, fatigue, et cetera, and being able to provide summaries of that kind of information back to people and that being of uh, particular, valuable, uh, particular uh, value. So in session four, we talked about the social challenges and specifically talking about the social challenges for deploying mobile technologies in different populations, um, underrepresented, uh, underrepresented and vulnerable populations, specifically um, kids and kids being today born digital. Um, and then also um, particularly interesting um, conversation about the challenges and opportunities in engaging the elderly. And with all of these three um, populations or population groups, the um, notion of being able to better engage all of these if we engage uh, families within the cohort. And so that's an interesting opportunity as well for the working group to consider. Our fifth uh, session was on overcoming technical challenges, and we have heard repeatedly that there are, um, there's variability between existing devices and certainly within the devices that will be developed over the coming years, but there's also um, some considerable variability between uh, any given device on any given person at any given time depending on what they are doing. And so that's a, a significant techno technological challenge. Um, we need um, quality of information in real time. We need metadata and provenance of that data. Um, we know that there's heterogeneity, heterogeneity in behavioral data, and we need, uh, that means that normalization is hard, uh, and one panelist said that it is a mess out there. Um, we need to control within the cohort and customize APIs. Um, data integration is going to be challenging. Data feeds are dumb. Um, I was, <laughs> in listening to that, I was thinking about the people who uh, accompanied me across the state of Iowa last week, and there were people who um, skateboarded across the entire state of Iowa, and I wonder what their Fitbit said. And there were three people who unicycled across the entire state of Iowa, and I would like to know what their Fitbit said. Um, there, you, what surgery they <laughs> you cannot shift down on a unicycle. Um, we talked about uh, trust and privacy and security challenges and um, how do we authenticate identity. Um, we talked about the potential for um, expectations of um, participants in the cohort that we are going to be 24-7 tech support for them, not only for the devices that we provide, but for all their other devices as well. Um, and so that uh, will need to be mediated. And then we talked about, in response to Francis's um, uh, comments, about potentially having a base bake-off for devices early on. And that's particularly interesting and intriguing because we have a prize authority uh, at NIH and in other agencies as well that we haven't used as much as we might. And so I think for some of these technological challenges, we might be able to effectively deploy uh, some of these prize opportunities where we say, this is what we want to develop, and whoever gets here first uh, gets um, X, whatever that might be. We talked about uh, potential pilot platforms in session six and talking about how um, using mobile devices and virtual uh, research visits, how that disrupts the standard mode of doing research. And I think in many ways the cohort is going to be disruptive uh, in, in all sorts of uh, uh, ways, and this is one of them. Talked about being able to use mobile technologies and mobile platforms for doing consent, for uh, doing assays, and for doing passive monitoring as well. Uh, we talked about um, enabling patients to get access to 
and enabling them to make decisions about sharing of data. Um, use, the use of phones in mental health research came up again in this panel and uh, has come up repeatedly throughout the, the um, time together. Sleep, activity, social interaction um, are the key human variables that we need to capture, um, and that was discussed. We talked about some of the possible disease-specific uses, Parkinson's, arrhythmias, which is misspelled, um, and mental health were some of the examples in this particular panel. And, um, and then uh, we talked a little bit about the challenge of the, uh, again, about the variability between devices and the software and how it is changing very, very fast. And so how can we have high quality data but still enable the uh, continued integration of new devices and new uh, measures throughout the course of the panel? or throughout the course of the cohort. So I didn't summarize uh, <laughs> session seven because it just happened, and if you don't remember, well. Um, have we got a sensor for you? <laughs> <laughs> have we got a sensor for you? Um, so in terms of what's next, um, what's immediately next is that the working group is going to convene in this room for a meeting starting at about 12.15. Uh, so please take your conversations outside. It's about 83 degrees outside right now, so it's uh, appropriate temperature for having a conversation. Um, <laughs> which I have data about that. Um, we're going to be working really hard over the course of the coming weeks to generate a draft report for consideration by the advisory committee to the NIH director. And this is going to be a very intense time for the working group members. We have been... Um, had uh, an opportunity to really focus on the key recommendations and we'll be putting those together along with the rationale leading us to those uh, key recommendations. And that report will be presented to the advisory committee in a public meeting in mid-September. And so keep your eye out. It's probably going to be the 16th or 17th or 18th of September. It will be a public meeting that you can uh, call in to. It may be a WebEx. It will not be live in person. And you can participate in that discussion. Um, and all the way along since we began this process with the President's announcement of this endeavor back in January, um, the NIH leadership from across the institutes and centers have been paying very close attention to um, all of the input that we've been getting from you all and from people who have been providing input through the request for information and through the uh, interactive feedback website. And so and then they have also been paying attention to the working group discussions and to the workshops. So they will be ready at the starting line the minute that this report is uh, accepted by uh, Dr. Collins to start to generate the um, concrete plans within the NIH for putting out funding announcements about how we are really going to build this cohort and starting uh, to actually put that into place. So this is going to be an exciting time between now and uh, the beginning of the fiscal year. And uh, please pay attention to the website, uh, the Precision Medicine website at NIH. We'll continue to keep our feedback site live. We'll post the report as soon as we have it. And um, I want to end by thanking uh, many people. I want to thank Eric especially uh, and the Intel Robots for um, hosting us here. I want to thank the folks in the back of the room who have been uh, doing a fantastic job helping us with um, AV along the way yesterday and today. I want to thank um, Bill Riley and Roderick Pettigrew and Alan Guttmacher who led the internal team that helped work with the working group to plan this really phenomenal workshop. I want to thank Gwen, who's been sitting next to me, and Allison and Lauren in the back, who have been um, staffing this working group from the beginning. I want to thank Palladian, who helped get us all here safely and put us up in our hotel. I want to thank the speakers and moderators from today's session. I want to thank the working group, and I want to thank all of you for your inputs. Um, thank you very much for coming. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.